powerful of how it all works and and, and pulls together. So and you can do some quite clever stuff. But any questions on there? Like I said, we've only covered sort of summarize, butate, and filter and arrange at the the most cursory level. Um, and you, you know that's going to be a complete rabbit hole. You're going to have to fall into and get your head around. You know how to how to do things. Um, but yeah, we could do much, much, much more exciting potential things with with that. And like I said, it does really open up lots of different areas that we can we can do. Any questions at this stage? No. Stunned silence. Okay, I'll take stunned silence as uh, as compliance or, or something. Anyway, so there we go. The answers. Uh, oh, right. So oh, there we go. And also, you we could have done it with the group by function as well by adding a group by instead of the by. But you know, that's just adding extra keystrokes when aren't necessary. So that is the official one. Uh, yeah, how to do that. Fabulous. So where are we? Are we at quarter? So we want to finish at quarter to one. Is that right? Um, so let me see where we are. Blimey, we are whizzing through it because we are super clever. So uh, showcase more functions. What is more functions? Let's have a look at those. So some other uh, dplyr functions that we can use. So there's some other useful bits and pieces. Uh, we can use a select, um, which pretty much works the same as a, a, a SQL select. So if we wanted to just select certain columns, uh, we can sort of, instead of filtering our rows, we can sort of filter our columns. And we can literally just say, I want to select these these columns. Um, it doesn't. That's very annoying. Why is that disappeared? OK, I'll come back to that. Uh, oh. No way. Uh, so yes, we can use um, a, a select method, which is basically by just spelling out our, uh, our column names. Select column names. And well, I've almost written column names. Uh, so that will just obviously just select my my uh, my two columns. You can do funkier select type things, so that we can just deselect something. So we can select minus org code, which will basically deselect org code and bring back everything else apart from org code. Uh, which is quite nice because sometimes it's like I want all of this, but I don't want that in there. So you can you can remove something. So um, copy that one in. Um, we can also do things uh, like uh, I want to reorganize my data. So I want my org name first, and then I want everything else. So I'm just going to say I want my org name and then everything. So when you do that select, and if you are implicit about your columns, that's the order they will appear. So if you want to reorder columns, you can use this select statement to reorder your columns. So obviously within a uh, within a uh, within your rows, you can use your arrange to reorder our our uh, our columns. Uh, so our rows, but within a to reorder our columns, we can use that select. As I said possibly earlier, and I mentioned on um, uh, factors, what we can do is select factors for our data. So potentially, I don't know, I mean, I'm thinking of a, a um, an NHSE example. Maybe we wanted to organize our data set by um, ICB. But for some reason, uh, well, I guess, you know, each of the ICBs fit in a different region. Maybe we didn't have we didn't know, we didn't have our data set, didn't tell us what region it is, but we want to organize our ICBs by region. So we could give them uh, a factor, which is based on their region. And then when we ordered, ordered our data, it would then order them and put them in the order by whatever region they're in. Um, so you can kind of create custom orders of things, which is, is really nice. Um, we can also use things like starts with, so we can select all the columns which start with org. 
um, which will literally look through our data set, find any columns which start with org and just select those. Uh, likewise, we can also, there's, a, there's an ends with, um, there's also a contains, so you can do like fuzzy matches on, on, on stuff as well. So just select any columns that has the word, I don't know, uh, trying to think of an example, but you know, attend attendance or value, or you can also tell it to, and I'm not going to be able to it now, but you can also tell it to select types of columns. So please select all the columns which are numeric or all the columns which are, um, you, you know, characters or whatever, or just, just select the columns which are uh, uh, our dates, etc. So you can do lots of things like that. There we go. We've got contains, uh, such as the strings or column names without the use of wildcards. So you can use this sort of SSA. Um, I don't know if you, yeah, are you... Take, let's say all the all the slides are available and you can sort of go back to them i don't know if you're trying to desperately type them in now and, and run through it uh, i'm just trying to make sure if we whiz through this bit which hopefully is a little bit quicker we have some more time at the end to do some more of the the, the, the free form stuff um we can also do things like uh, n distinct and n. So I did n earlier, which was just a, a basic count of how many things there are. Um, you can also do like an n distinct. So we can also identify how many distinct organization codes there are, uh, which is which is quite interesting. So not only so RDE appears twenty one times, but how many times does it appear distinct? Thinkly. Uh so why is that different? That's weird. Oh no, 21 is the number of organization uh there are, and then three is how many distinctly are RDE. That's how that's made up, I think. Yeah. Uh so yeah, we can we can have a look at those. So N distinct is uh, is another quite useful kind of thing. So you can count the number of distinct values. Um doesn't like say distinct doesn't work quite in the same way as a SQL does, and it works much nicer. It's, it's, yeah, SQL distinct a bit of a dodgy thing and very, very, very computationally expensive. So don't use distinct in SQL if you can help it. Uh, probably better to do it here, and you can also give it really nice rules. And uh, so I'm not going to have time to go through it, but there's a really nice package called Janitor which is got to be my, my two things when I start up a piece of code is loading tidyverse and loading janitor. Janitor's got really nice thing for renaming all your column names and putting them all into snake case, which is my favorite function. Again, it's like read data. Second function is clean names, which just tidies up all my data. And then it's got really nice functions for identifying duplicates and picking the right you know picking duplicates across several features and then picking which which one of those you want to keep um you know so that's that's really nice anyway I'm not gonna go there anyway that's the end of that one uh hopefully you got the idea of that there's lots of other bits and pieces that we can do on that so let's do this one so yeah I think these are quite quick and dirty ones before we get into the um, uh, into the data set. So we've loaded in some data and we've created an object, which basically, oops, what's going on there? Ugh, that's funky. Where are we? Uh, we're over here. So when we've loaded in our data, we've created these objects. However, when we've run all of this, all we have done is create a little output in our in our uh, in, in our console. So if I just take this data, oh sorry, this code, create objects. Ooh, there we go. So I've got my data there, but now I want to create a new object, which is my data summary and i use this left hand arrow and minus sign which is the assignment operator so here we had our uh, pipe operator this is the assignment operator so now when i run this code it doesn't appear here instead 
Da, da, da. Can anybody spot what's happened? I blurp some coffee quickly. He's in my NHSR community mug, I hope you recognise. So, uh, hopefully you have spotted up here in the top right-hand corner, I now have something called Data Summary. And if I click on that, I have now got a new data frame, uh, which is my data. So all of these bits now, so I've created a new data frame. So now if I wanted to do something on my data summary, uh, I can't remember what's in there. So I don't know, data summary and if I wanted to filter, uh, what have I got? Perk -oc less than uh, I mean, 0.9, just to whip out this. So I can do that. And then that will show me, whoops, okay. Why have I got these appearing? That's very annoying. Uh, it will show me here in the in the thing. But actually, if I want to overwrite here, so now I've got 77 observations of five variables. If I do this assignment to my data summary, what I'm going to do is take my data summary, and my data summary is going to be my data summary, but then filtered. So what I'm going to do is pretty much overwrite my data summary, as it were, with uh, filtering it for the 0.95, so if I, sorry, 0.9. So if I run that, we should see this come down to fewer rows, which we do, 49. So we can see now we've got 49 uh, observations of five variables. That would be the same as, you know, I could have added that into that pipe if I wanted to. That would be, you know, that would come out with the, the same result. But I haven't, I've, I've done it here as a, as a separate thing. And then sometimes what you do want is different cuts of that same data. So I might want to filter this by, uh, let me see. Uh, I don't know. I might want to filter it by organ. I don't know. It's a bad example, but all the organization names that have a partnership in them, for instance. So I could do a filter for all the all the ones that are partnership in one data frame, which might feed into one chart or a different table. And then I might have something using that same basic data frame, but actually the ones that haven't got uh, whatever I just said into a different data frame, which goes into a different table. So that's why you might want to do it in, in that way. Um, so I might have this as, you know, less than. And then if I run that, I've now got two data summaries. I've got my data summary, which is my full version. And then I've got my data summary less, which has got my trimmed to my 0.9. So this is where we can start creating lots and lots of lovely objects in our global environment. This is parked back to this morning when I was talking about saving your R environment, uh, et cetera. So for instance, if I, I don't know, I was doing something on data summary less, and I changed my data summary because data less is a separate object, but it's obviously linked to data summary. It's very simple to change something here and have a knock on effect later on. But unless I rerun this, it's still going to be working on my data summary less, which hasn't been changed. So I don't know if that makes sense, but hopefully start showing that doing that, saving your environment can can cause some issues i say saving the environment causes issues don't snip that out and take it anyway you know what i mean anyway so creating an object uh, i think i've just done that anyway so you can create objects from code uh, so we did that we had our veg objects when we were just running like that the underlying object didn't change however we now created a a, a shortcut uh, sorry, a new object, which is our bed occupancy. Uh, this is assignment operator. You can use the alt and minus apparently to do it. I just never do, uh, but there are some shortcuts. Uh, so naming style, um, there is camel case, Pascal case, snake case, and uh, 
kebab. I've never heard of kebab case, um, but not in here. Um, apparently, it's used in Markdown, but not in scripts. So we're weird. Um, so I don't think uh, ke kebab case works in scripts. I think it, it evaluates that as a minus, so it would go wrong. Camel case, I found really ugly. I don't know. I do all my stuff in snake case. And like I say, when it comes to outputting and I want a, a title on there, I'll change it at that point. And there are some really nice functions where you can just change everything to to a different case and, and whatever and make it whatever you whatever you want. So that's all fine. Um and like I say, there are other ways you can do it on all capitals, etc. But that's that's you know not good practice. So there we go. We've made objects. How are we doing for time? We're doing great. Um, so let's go back to here. Uh, where are we? Do a little, 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 little. Vectors. There we go. Oh, we're doing good. Doing vectors. And then um, I get joins in or we'll start on joins just before lunch because who doesn't like doing joins? Uh, so vectors. So vectors are... They are in a different format, um, but basically it's it's a way of sort of combining things into into one, uh, or giving our multiple inputs. So let me see. Let's give an example. So we can create an object. So at the moment, all these objects are like data frame objects. This uh, vectors kind of like another object you can use it as a separate object or it can sort of stand alone so we can do vector and assign it and we always put it within a c for i think it means combine or concatenate and we can just do one two three and now we see instead of a data type which is a frame we've now got a vector and our vector contains the values of one two and three well I'll go back to assignment of um objects as well um so say we want to uh create an object called i don't know actually let's start showing you how to do some funky bits here so we want to do our perk cut and we want to create a variable and we're going to call it and call it 0 0.8 so unlike sql you don't have to um, call and assign or whatever or does it straight away so if we run perk cut is 0 0.8 and run that we now have a value of perk cut which is 0 0.8 so if we literally look at perk cut here it will return 0 0.8 what we can do is feed that variable into our data set there so instead of cutting it to less than 0 0.8 0 0.9 it will change it to whatever our perk cut is so if we run that and we look at our summary less, we can see now they're all less than 0 0.8. Where R gets really, really powerful is this not this perk cut could be a result of a previous bit of analysis. So that can be dynamic, and then we can feed that dynamic bit into, into this. So you could have, yeah, it just starts making that date, you know, that, that bit. A little bit more dynamic so if you wanted to do create a variable which is i don't know 18 months less than today's date and then you want to filter so you've only got their last 18 months of data etc you can just feed all that kind of stuff into a into a data frame or you can you know build something out separately so yeah you can you can do lots of clever things like that so you can sort of refer to things outside of your your part anyway going back to vectors uh, so we've got a vector which has got like multiple um, multiple inputs. So vectors will allow you to uh, mix your characters and strings. They will they will do that. Um, I was quite lucky that it allows you to do that. Um, and you can also use it to 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 do sort of various other other things. So. So let's look for uh, more than one date. So where previously we had done dates, uh, et cetera, what we're going to do here is create a, a little vector, and we want to use this vector to look up our organization. So we're going to chuck this basically into a filter statement. Um, so I'm going to copy that into the chat so that you don't have to write Bradford District Care Trust because 
I know for sure if I tried to type that out, it's going to, yeah, I'd, I'd fail massively. So um, <laughs> so let's create a, uh, a, a, basically all we need is this second bit here where we're going to create uh, a, a lookup variable, which is going to contain two things. So let's just copy that one. And we're going to create an, a new object which is a uh, a vector and it's going to be uh Bradford care district and whatever this would Bradford district care trust so we want to use that in our little filter and we're going to use the in command in works the same pretty very very similar to the um uh sql as in oh, literally there's an example there uh, but it does come with these funky percentage signs around it for reasons unknown. It's quite an old function, and I think that's possibly why. Also, in I think is used in other areas as another um, uh, another place as well. So we're going to take our beds data and then we're going to filter it where the organization name is in our org lookup. So hopefully, if we run that one. So hopefully it will uh it will run free and there we can see we've now filtered our data where we've got it in these two organizations and obviously if we wanted to create that as a separate object beds uh brad let's call it is beds data and then we could oh my can't spell brad Let's Brad, change that into there, and now we've got a new object up here, and there we go, let's Brad, and we can see that that contains the organization names. Have we got that? Does that make sense, what that's doing? Um, and I think there was a, where was it, right back up here somewhere, I'm trying to remember. Yes, I think that was when we were looking at the group by of stuff, which I probably can't do an example of here. But if we wanted to do a group by multiple things, then we also have to feed that in a, a vector. So if we wanted to find uh, the, the highest by date and organization name, etc., we would uh, do our bar, dot by, and then we would just feed it a vector. So we can do it like this, where we've got it as a, as a separate vector. We can also... You know, you can hard code it so that bit can replace that. So you can actually sort of feed it within there. That would work exactly the same. So I would just stick that on another line just to be pretty. But yeah, so you could you could hard code it there. But again, it's probably easier to, to sort of tweak things here, etc. And again, you could make this this vector a result of a separate data frame. So you say you wanted to filter your overall beds data by, I don't know, whichever this this highest percentage and slice the top two or something, and then feed the results of that into another filter, etc. You could you could do that. Uh, but we're not going to go there today because uh probably frying your brains enough where we've got about five minutes so that's good um we can also do a not in by using the exclamation mark again uh by saying organization not in our lookup so if we go literally oh where are we this one and we do our uh i'm just going to remove my beds brad it's a bit weird how you do it you do not oops, not org name in rather than org name not in which takes a little bit of getting used to uh, but if we look at that one uh you have to trust me that <laughs> bradford's not in there we can see that we've got four five two seven and we can see we've got four five five eight up here so we have dropped out some um some data so we can definitely see that we have somehow has gone uh, so we can do not in, and there we go, end session. Right, I don't think we're going to have to do, we're not going to do joins in five minutes. So 
I think that's a jolly good time to give us five minutes feedback, catch up, any questions, and then we can have some lunch. So open five minutes. How are we doing? Too fast, too slow? Can you actually put your R screen back on? Yep. Thank you. No questions coming up in the chat at the minute, so obviously everybody's very Anybody happy. brave enough to shout? Anybody still stuck on the import data set? <laughs> Am I going too fast or is it okay? Or oh, scream if you want to go faster. It, it's not quite a good pace as it is. Okay. I do feel it's 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 quite fast, but if you're keeping up, then that's great. What a clever bunch you are. Uh okay. In that case, if there aren't any massive questions, we are at quarter to now what time did you need to be back or do you think you'll be done Susie uh, I wouldn't base it on me but I should be back at about quarter past one okay how long do people want then so that's half an hour do you want 45 minutes an hour three hours 45 be handy for me but 45 no any, one any, 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 any bids? More than 45? 45, okay? Yep. Okay, so that will be half past one by my calculations. Okay, welcome back. Hope you all had a nice lunch. Uh, we're going to go back into our introduction to our course, and I will remember to share my screen because, you know, that would be really foolish if I didn't. So uh, we're going to do some joins now, uh, which is all around sort of like relational databases and, and joining stuff together, which I'm sure people have done in SQL in, uh, I guess, more in more in um, what that, Excel terms, probably like a, a VLOOKUP um, where you are trying to pull data from one place and join it to data in another based on, on something else where it, where it all matches. But we're going to, we're going to walk through it really, really slowly and gently, and, uh, hopefully it will make sense. So, uh, quite often data that we have is not in a single table. So it might be in Excel terms, it might be in different, different worksheets and you want to join the two things together. So as I said, in, in, uh, in SQL, uh, we would do joins uh, or probably something like a lookup or a, or a match or something. And we probably have a common key or keys in order to join our data set up together. Um, all the joins in SQL are, are called mutating joins. Uh, we do have some called filtering joins where we have joins where we have concepts such as exists or using the uh, where clause in SQL. <clears throat> if you've gone down that far into uh, into joining within SQL, um, I'm probably, I don't know, left join and just occasionally probably do an inner join as far as my SQL knowledge goes. Um, but obviously if you are more advanced SQL, then the, the other, other joins are available. So our, oh, look at this, animations and everything. So our left join is what we're going to start with. So we're going to have two tables and we're going to keep the structure of X. Uh, so basically everything that's in our left-hand table, we're going to keep, and then we want to match it uh, where we've got an ID that matches from our, our table Y. Um, and make sure those are key uh, across both ways and come out with a data set which is going to have all of the stuff from X and then pull in stuff from Y where it matches. Um, obviously, if you're a SQL user, this is second second knowledge. Excel-based, probably a little bit trickier to, but so is this like, you know, we are looking across another table to bring in our, you know, within, within uh, Excel, you just bring in one feature, but you're bringing in a feature from a different table and then you're matching it, you're doing a lookup against another key. 
and where it matches you want to bring in that value so that's essentially what we're doing this is our lookup table and we're pulling it across and we're joining it to this table where it where it matches so we are going to import some files to join up together obviously we can all completely not remember how to do this uh so there's three uh three files we want TB cases, TB pop, and TB new table. So we go back to our, our studio, and obviously it's fallen asleep over lunch. So let's just wake it up. While that's waking up, if yours is already awake, there you go. I'm just going to pop this to the side so I can see it wake up separately. I know it's still going there. There we go. Right. So we've got TB, what was it? Cases pop a new table. So load in data to join. So you can use the wizard. So we can do import data set from text, browse, uh, where are we? TB cases, open, copy that bit and import. I oh, know, not import and do OK. So where we go? Oh, not there. Down here somewhere. So TB cases, read that in. The other one we want to read in is TB pop. So you don't have to use the wizard. We can just change it here. And we can just run that. And then the third one we want to do is new table. Yeah. That is new underscore table. And that is new new underscore table. Uh you might do just to clear up all this junk, because obviously we've got a load of junk uh, left over from our previous uh stuff which we probably don't want. So again, we can flush that if we want. We can flush that, get rid of those all, and just load in the data sets that we are going to be playing with, which is those three. Hopefully everybody's got there. Remember how to use the wizard, or you can just type them in, whichever is going to be more convenient for you. So... Let's have a look at our data sets. <clears throat> so always good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Always good. First thing to do is have a look at what we've got. Obviously, we can see we've only got 16 observations of three variables. So we've got tiny little data sets. We have got uh, a TB pop, which has got a country, a year, and a population number. And then we've got uh, some a TB cases, which has got a country, a year, and some cases. So basically, what we want to do is create one table, which has got the country, the year, the population, and the case, and and the cases. So basically, we want to pull the cases over into the other into the other table. Basically, is that yeah. So again, if we were going to do a, a V lookup, we would be looking up this and bringing through the cases into our pop file. So we had a country year pop, and then we would have cases here as a separate file, file uh, column. There we go. Hopefully that will make sense. So, uh, so we're going to join two tables together, which is cases of tuberculosis. That's a joyous subject. Uh, one with population. And then finally, just double check our new table because we did bring in another table, uh, which has got something else in there, which we will come back to later, uh, which is basically our place, our year, and the first letter, which I believe is just simply the first letter of the place, uh, which we will be using to do some funkier stuff later on, but just to show you what's in there. So we've got three, three tables. Everybody got their free tables up and running, I hope. Uh, do shall it not. So we're going to join our two tables together. So when columns have the same name in R, uh, where are we? Yeah. So where columns have the same labels in R, 
uh, I resolve the conflict by adding X and Y to the column names. So basically we're joining everything in together at the moment. So we're going to do our table cases, then we'll do left underscore join. So it's not two separate words like it is in SQL. It's one command and the one command is called left underscore join or left join or uh, in one. And then we're going to take our table table cases and then we're going to left join our uh, table pop and by is the key. So we want to join it where our, uh, where they match by um, country. So that's what we want to do. So hopefully, as per always, if we go back here, so we're going to do TB uh, cases, and then left underscore join. Let's see, I see, and I pressed, uh, I pressed tab which completed it for me, gave me my brackets, and then I want to join TB uh, pop by equals uh, country. Oh, there we go. Let's move this up here. So I've got a few issues here, and it's come up with a warning. So it's not failed. The data hasn't failed. Uh, but it is giving me a uh, a warning, and can anybody work out why it's doing? Why is it giving me a warning? I mean, literally, <laughs> you can read the actual warning. It will tell you the reason it's giving you a warning. So. Where we look at our two data frames, we've got table pop and we've got table cases. We can see that not only uh, if we if we filter it by or order it by there, we've got Afghanistan here and we've got the year 19. Oh, no, wrong table. Let's get rid of that one. Uh, table pop. We've got Afghanistan here for the year 1999, our population, and then we're going to join it to this table by Afghanistan, but we can see that we've got four Afghanistans. So it's gonna pull across all four of them and give us a, a one-to-many relationship, as in it's not checking for the year as well. It's just purely checking on Afghanistan. So it's created us a whole bunch of duplicates. If we, oh, does it keep jumping there? Uh, if we pop that into a uh, an object, might make it easier to see because then we can look at the whole data frame and as we can see for country for this year and the cases it's linked up each of the years and it's given us um the populations for each each year so basically it's done a one to many so where it's 1999 it's linked up all of those and that will be the same across each of the years it's joined each each year so bit like in Excel, you would join, I mean, generally a VLOOKUP would only search for one feature, which is, uh, you can get it to do multiple things, but it's it's a bit of a challenge. Um, and likewise in SQL, you can give it multiple uh, join uh, criteria. So in this instance, we want to join it by our uh, country and we want to join it by our year. So let's have a look at how we do that. Very, very simply, we go back to our lovely friend, uh, the vector, uh, which we all learned about earlier. And when then we feed in a vector to our join and we can oh, also do it, uh, give it a join by, um, which also feeds in a slightly nicer syntax. So this is a newer syntax. So this is like the old school way of doing it. New school way is uh, use join by. Uh, which is relatively new, and I must admit I would still do it old school way because that's the way I was taught. But let's go with the new modern way. We're going to do left join, join by, and then we're going to feed in two different uh, two different features. This is also linking directly through to uh, a, a variable name, which is great. Whereas this, we're feeding in a string, so this makes much much more sense and and works much nicer. 
Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I thought I'll come that one for a, for a while. Um, so yeah, use, let's use this join by. Uh, if I can find where my code is again. So I'm going to do TB cases, TB pop, let's join underscore by. It's not an equals. It doesn't need to go in speech marks. Uh, table, is it table? Is it year? Yeah. And then if we run that one, oh, I missed out a bracket. Okay. This is a classic. So. I have done a boo-boo and I have left out a closing bracket. So you can see I've got an open and close there, but I haven't got a corresponding uh, close bracket for my um, for my uh, for, for my code. So here, and I, I don't know if you've counted this before, I should have mentioned it earlier, uh, but I'm very naughty and I didn't. R is now giving me this like plus sign. So it's like it's 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 waiting for something. It's like, well, you haven't finished your 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 function. It's it's still going. What's what's happening? I need need something else. So what I could do is manually type in a, a close bracket and it would at least evaluate that and I know what's going on. Or if I'm really stuck, I could just press escape and that will just escape out of it. And then as we can see here. We've got a little uh, arrows, a little error sign. Oh, look at that! And it's even telling me unmatched opening bracket. So it's telling me exactly uh, what my what my issue is here and why it's not failed. Uh, why it's not failed? Why it's not worked? So let's just run it again, just to show I could put in my close bracket and that would work. Or if I run it and I just put in some gobbledygook, it's just going to go. What the heck is going on there? Uh, I don't understand. So B, let's be good and put in my closing bracket properly. And now when I run this, uh, correct, let's call that correct. I run my TB cases. Let's create a new correct data object. And when I look at that now, I can see that I've got one country, one year, and my cases and population, and it's pulled across properly. And it's joined all nicely. Everybody okay with that? I say I think it's worth seeing that incorrect version. We probably should have just done a simple one-to-one -one join to start with. Um, I think it's a bit cheeky to jump straight into uh, a, a two-key join, but you know, you're all clever people. I'm sure uh, it will be fine. So hopefully that makes sense, and hopefully it understands why it went wrong in in the first instance. This join by country. So if you've got multiple, you don't have to do multiple. So you can do correct. Uh, so you can do da -da -da -da. that will work for one. I think it's probably nicer. So if we did that again, you know, that's going to go wrong and it's going to duplicate everything on year, which again is going to give me massive amounts of one to many to many to many, etc. But we don't want to do that because that's wrong. Wrong. I didn't spell wrong correctly. Look at that. Right. Everybody okay with a simple left join and understand A, what it's doing, and B, the code behind it and why we would do that? Is there anybody? Yeah. Susan? Fine. Yeah, yeah. You okay? Yeah, all good. All right, sorry. <laughs> you came off mute. I thought you were about to go. Yes. Don't understand. That's okay. Cool. Right. So uh, that's that's really nice. Nice way of doing it. Um, default combine. Uh, so dplyr joins can uh, occur automatically. So it can do some nice things and it can spot automatically where you've got matching uh, variables across the things and it will do, it will do the join by itself without you being specific around what you're joining. Uh, that can be really, really dangerous. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend that but just to say that it can do that um but generally it's it's much better to spell out and be be implicit i know i'm usually saying oh let's reduce the number of keystrokes i think there are some things like this where it's actually it's it's, it's quite good um sometimes uh what we have is a table with a different column name in one 
compared to a different column name in the other, but you still want to join them. If you work at NHS England, this is a classic. It will be called ICS what name in one thing, and in the next table is called ICB name in the in the next table. Exactly the same data, but you want to join them join them up. Um, and I'm sure there are probably similar things in other data sets, but that's an absolute classic NHS England issue. So uh, what we can do is is tell it what what the connections are. So in our TB new table, we've got some different column names, but they're essentially the same. So we've got our country, which is our place. And again, looking at our case sensitivity, uh, R would not recognize year to be year. If if one is um if if one is capitalized and the other isn't. So again, you have to be explicit, um, implicit, explicit, I can't remember. One of those two. Uh, and uh, absolutely spell out what, what the differences are. So we're going to use the, the modern version again here to, to join our table together. So we're going to join our new table. So we're joining our, doing a left join onto our new table. And we if we look at our new table, as you can see, we've got place with a cap, uh, capital place and we've got year with a capital Y. And so we're going to join by country is place, year is year. And you've got, I think, let me just double check. Uh, I think it does matter which order you put them in, as in you've got to do it. This is what's on the left and this is what's on the right. That could be wrong. Let's find out. Yeah, it doesn't like it. Uh, so yeah, you've got to have them in the right order for it to work which quite often will throw me. So always imagine that your 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 standard table is what you're starting on. This is your left-hand side of things. And then you're adding stuff onto the right-hand side of it. And I always picture it in my mind. That's where I'm going to put my new column. It's on the right-hand side. So I'm joining it. Left is what I'm doing. So I'm joining to the left, as it were. So, uh, and then if we look at this... Quick question: <clears throat> Are the equals equals um, yes. a comment or a new field name? Sorry, I missed the last little bit of that. Were the equals equals um, giving it a fit new field name? No, no, <laughs> that is telling it it's a uh, is is equal to. Okay. So as I yeah, so equals is is, and then double equals is equals to. Okay. So if you sort of read it out loud. A bit like where we did up here, where we did join by country and year. What we're saying now is we're joining these two tables. Country is equal to place. Year is equal to year with a with a capital Y. So that's what we're saying nice. because they're called different things. So it's yeah. So spell it out. When you see that double equals, it means is equal to. Um, yeah, it's a bit of an odd one, but yeah. Because usually that is just purely a, a test of equality. So if I do, uh, let me see. So for four equals, double equals four is true. Four is the same as three is false. I can do A equals, uh, sorry, assign three to my variable A. So I can do A three and I can do a double equals three again which would be true um so yeah that's that's kind of what that double equals whereas if i do a equals three now this will be really really confusing and i don't recommend doing it uh, sorry if i do a equals four it will just take it but what it's done is taken this equal to be like an assignment operator so now if we look at my value for four it's change it so now i'm saying a is for not it not doing a true or false check of four so that's why r is r will accept an equals to do an assignment but it's it's really good practice that our assignment operator is completely separate to just doing equals um yeah it will accept equals but it, it just will throw you and i guess any python users here will know that you know that's generally how python would use it, it would use an equals but 
I don't know. Uh, does do it differently, but I think it's a, I think it is a much better way keeping those two things separate. Um, so yeah, this is just saying is equals to. So yeah, four is equal to four is true. Four is equal to three is false. So um, so yeah, join by and that's doing an is equals to. So we can do much different types of joins. So we can do a a, a semi join. So semi joins uh, return the date on the left if it matches on the right, but also drops the right. So it's not like an inner join, which keeps both sides. I hope that makes sense. And uh, maybe we're, we're running through some, which will hopefully solidify what it is. Um, I'm not a fan of anything other than left joins, to be honest. I think you can do most things that you want to with a left join, but we're going to go through them just to show there are other types. You can usually achieve what you want in a semi-join or a funky join by doing some wares or some filterings in, in some other ways, which personally, I find it more readable. However, you, you might want, you might like this. So anyway, so we're looking at these two things and we're going to join them just where they match if they don't match from either place then we're going to then we're going to drop them so let's have a look so finding a hospital that had covid19 uh but only bring back the information the hospital nothing about the test so we want to join the table new tb new table and bring back only the records where the first letter is a but drop the data from the new table. Does that make sense? That's quite a crazy thing. So we're going to uh, take our case. So first of all, we're going to make a lookup table, which is basically our new table. And then we're just going to filter it to the first letter is A. So that's our new data. And we're just going to do a filter just to give us a, a cut down version of that table. So let's just do that there. And again, our filter is our our first letter is equal to A. So again, that double equals is our is equals to. So So we're going to start off with our lookup table. And our lookup table is surely going to be uh, Afghanistan for these years. And that's our first letters. So we want to get our, getting back to here, we want to get our table cases, join it to our new table, but drop anything that doesn't appear in either table. So it's a bit like an inner join, uh, but it's going to drop anything where it doesn't match at all. So let's just run the semi join, which is in here. And that will give us that sort of in a in a join ish things um yeah not a massive fan of this section so uh like i say i think the left join is is really 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 powerful the other bits i would probably do by a left join and then i would filter i would add that filter equals a into my uh into my uh after my left join I guess it's just the way of knocking out a step if you are confident with with that. So, but however, some of the other joins are quite useful. So, anti join. So, looking at the joins where X and uh, stuff that's not in. So, looking at X, joining it to Y, and then only join only returning those where they don't match. So that's a bit of a bizarre concept, but really good for like data quality checks. So if you are expecting, you know, you've got our list of providers here and we're expecting submissions from all these providers or we've we've got our list of teams and we're expecting a, a, a data item from each of the teams, we can join those two things up and this will just return where we haven't got a match. 
Uh, so literally it is that anti-join. It's like where we haven't got a match and it will return those. So like I said, it's a really good data quality type thing. So we'll look at what we've had previously. So taking on that semi-join, we're going to do a kind of reverse semi-join, I guess, as it were. So if we look at this 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 table cases and pretty much just swap out where you've written uh, semi and change that to anti. So that will give us the, the opposite. So it will hopefully bring back everything except for Afghanistan, uh, which indeed it does. So those are all the records then that don't match, uh, haven't got a, a corresponding uh, uh, match in the in the other table. So again, as I said, that's a really good data quality doing anti joins. Um, you know, if you want to compare two, you know, if you can do really really clever things. You can create, you know, if you've got big data sets or you've got things and you really want to check if like you know two sheets are the same and they've got the same data in them or something like that. You know, you can use this to to spot where where you've got differences, which is which is really cool. So, so that's an anti join, and that's as far as we go with join. So, okay, so anti join, like I say, is quite useful. Not sure about semi join. I would probably do that in a filter, but I guess understanding that semi join gets you then onto the uh, the, the anti join. But don't worry about those. Stick with left joins. That will get you as far as you prob probably need. Um, and you know the the really nice thing is you can do that left join and then you know this all of these commands also work in a pipe so where we've got this and then we want to add in some of the stuff that we did earlier so we want to do filter year greater than what have we got uh, uh, greater than equals two thousand. There you go, and then we can remove 1999. So you know you can do all the same stuff. And if we wanted to do um, summarize total equals uh, sum cases dot by uh, country no dot by equals country. There we go. And then we can create a, a total by country. So like I say, you can do all those sort of joins and blah, 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 and then feed it all into a, a, a nice pipeline and all of those stuff. So, and again, like I said, there's nothing stopping you then doing another filter after you. So we've filtered by year, we've done our summarize, and then we just want to filter our total is less than, what have we got? Uh, 200,000. There we go, et cetera. So, uh, if I, yeah. So let's say that, you know, the pipes is really, really, really powerful in, you know, what you can do. So you can just do a bit and then do a bit and then add a bit and then add a bit and add a bit um, and just create really, really nice pipelines of, of manipulating data. Okie dokie. Uh, any questions on that? Seriously, my oh, goodness me! Right, one of you lot is going to uh, is going to do right. So let's do some code styling. Uh, then we will. Where did we, when did we come back? Was it half past one? I can't remember. Okay. Uh, right. So we've all written some beautiful code. Uh, we might have written some ugly code because you know our doesn't really mind massively about certain things so if i wanted to i could yeah i could mess this stuff around i could move things around i could have that all on one line i could miss out all my spaces and i could do that if i really really wanted to oh that's given me uh, i could run that and it's still going to work, you know. But hopefully you can see, and as you see, I've been I'm doing stuff. That's that's not pretty. However, sometimes when you're writing stuff and you're creating stuff and you're in that, oh, how do I do this? I have to see now that, you know, sometimes that's what your, your coat spits out like. And 
yes, you can go through it and you can manually tidy it all up, but you know, we're busy people. So if only there was a nice way to be able to get somebody else or even get our studio to tidy up your code for you. <gasps> Look at this next section. There we go. So we are going to install ourselves a package called Styler, uh, which pretty much does what it says on the tin. So can you remember how to install the package from way back this morning? Uh, so let's see if we can do that. So we want to go. We can either literally type in here, install.packages and styler but you know i uh, it's not something we need to do uh or we can go up to install packages and do it here which for this it's uh nice easy to do it once and this also makes sure then that i've got all my uh, appropriate dependencies so i do it here i think claire put a nice analogy in the in the uh in the chat around what a library is as a fact so this is us going to the shop and buying the book and then when we call the library, that's actually picking out the book from the shelves and, and reading it. And then if we didn't want to use it, we can keep it in the shelves. But this is us getting us a, a book and popping it in the shelves. So we're going to do install packages styler. And that will ooh, do a little chug through. And now that has well, done a thing. Uh, so that's installed styler. So styler is a bit of a weird package in that it's not so much a set of commands, it's a group of add-ins. So if we go back up to our little add-ins here, we've got now got a little thing I should have showed you previously. Uh, we now have got a new set of functions here, which are add-ins, uh, which is quite nice. Uh, so what I can do is I can highlight a bit of my dirty, rotten, horrible code and say style selection. Oh, there we go. It's asking me if I want to. Oh, yes, I do need to do that. Uh, I don't think this is, does this on the desktop? This is a cloudy thing. So let's just go there and it will ask to do a little install. Uh, there we go. Right. And I will try again because it wants to do that. And now when I do it, ta-da, it's tidied my code up for me and made it much, much prettier. Um, so see if you can have a go at finding some dirty code or i say dirty that's not and i suppose it's cleaning up your code some some messy code that you have have built um and literally you just kind of cover hover over a section go into add-ins and style selection you can style the entire page etc or the, the entire package there are different styles this uses a a standard tidyverse style um, and it's yeah, ninety percent pretty good, I think. There are a few things I would change. I would uh, I would probably put those onto new lines. Um, but beyond that, and possibly where these brackets are is a little bit confusing. I don't know. But uh, there is something about sort of tabbing, or you know, pretty much after every comma, putting a, a, a return. But again, it's like I said, it's a really nice little package, which hopefully just makes your code a little bit more readable and, and useful. I've probably said all that needs to say. Uh, our studio automatically indents. Hopefully we've we've spotted that as we've been, been playing. And uh, like I said, indents aren't important to R. It's just to make it, make it prettier. Uh, and you can press Control I to apply indents. Uh, we've literally taken some of this code and we've, um, so yeah, if we take some unindented code, oh, see, look, it's done it automatically. We need to unindent it. And then we do, is it control I? It will indent it for me automatically, which is quite nice um but yeah and literally you, you can write it all onto one big long line um and not put any spaces in or anything uh let me just copy that lovely line into the chat for you and then you can just run the styler over it uh where's the chat gone oh, where's the chat gone the chat's so there's the chat
there you go so you can copy that big long chunk of single line code and then literally apply styler to it and hopefully ugh, as you can see it's crossed our line of doom and everything and we can do that style selection and there we go it's still crossing over this so it's not not perfect i would possibly put that on a different line and i would put that on a different line as well and there we go looking much much nicer now so you know organizing your code isn't essential but believe me future you will will much prefer to read that than uh one long garbage piece of line there okay so have a go at styler so we did that and we did style active file and there we go cool so now we get on to doing some pretty stuff we're going to do some graphs so done some you know we've done some wrangling and we've done some bits and pieces but now we want to actually plot our data and and do some graphage graphage that's should be a word uh so we want to we want to create a, a data master, masterpiece as it says there so um gonna point you to some more links at the end of the course um but there is a really good uh, O'Reilly book, After Data Science, written by Happy Wickham, who pretty much is the curator of our studio and um, the Tidyverse. Um, you can get uh, hard copies of these books, but they're also written in a markdown version and free versions are available on the web. So all of this stuff is regularly updated by very, very clever people. It says R for Data Science. Don't get put off by the data science bit. There is some data science stuff towards the end, but throughout, you know, the a good first half of the book isn't data science. It's just data wrangling and, and visualization and all of those really, really good things. So don't get put off that. So anyway, we are going to copy a lot of the stuff out of this, this book. Um, so ggplot is part of the tidyverse. It works in a very, very similar sort of way. Um, other... So it is a library that's part of the tidyverse. There are other um, plot packages. So Plotly is a is a very famous one, um, which is used by quite a few places. Mainly, ggplot will come out with a static graph. There you go. There's your graph. What Plotly does allows you to create, uh, when we're doing our uh, outputs later, well, and I'll show you, we can create sort of interactive uh, plots um which have got like hover overs and uh, elements to sort of zoom in and um switch off traces and do all manner of uh of funky things um so yeah plotly is used by public health scotland uh so yeah but ggplot and uh plotly are probably your your main two that we use but there are some other other uh, uh packages out there as well um, and there are there's also a basic uh, plot function within just base R as well, um, which uh, is is pretty terrible, but it does the job if 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 you need to be. If you wanted to just absolutely go through and like plot a histogram uh, without any with the most absolute minimal histogram you need just to be able to see uh, your uh, your data in that sort of exploratory data analysis. You can literally do that with hist and the variable name of what you want to pull through and it will create a plot for you in, in base R. So there are some really good use cases for it, but I'm not going to go through that particularly now. So why is GG popular? Uh, all of those reasons. And there's some good uh, points down there, which uh, work there is. Um, obviously, we can do some really, really nice stuff. Uh, BBC use GG plot, as does The Economist. Uh, there are some ways that we can, we you know, we're not going to get into this level of stuff, but all these things where we've got like annotations over graphs and additional lines and, um, you know, all this level of colours and, you know, additional bits is all absolutely 100% possible within ggplot and everything within the plot is up for grabs and you can tweak absolutely everything and make it all all dynamic to your your go code and your data so you know if you wanted to reproduce this report with this kind of graph in and you want these annotations to annotate your you know your latest data or 
you know, be dynamic to what the latest mean is or whatever. You can absolutely do that. So, um, and also things like, uh, I think I flashed it up very, very briefly earlier, things like SPC charts. So we've created a, a plot the dots SPC module, um, which basically allows us to sort of create SPCs using the sort of SPC um, uh, sort of colors, et cetera, from, from the, the plot the dots, et cetera. So uh, some really, really good stuff. And just the multitude of different types of plots. I mean, you have absolutely got your hands tied if you are using just your bog standard Power BI or uh, Excel or Tableau type stuff. I mean, you can just find uh, plots for absolutely anything and, uh, and everything within uh, R. Not to say that you know you're going to go down that route, but yeah, but we're going to do some basic stuff anyway. So, uh, ggplot is part of the tidyverse. Uh, if you want to, you can start a new script or we can just carry on from where we are. I'm just going to carry on because it's just been messy. But if you wanted to start a new script, then we would be starting with lighting. Uh, yeah, so we've been starting with lighting ti library tidyverse. Um, I'm assuming you've already got that in there, so you don't need to worry about that. So we're going to load in some data and we're going to do a little bit of a bit of analysis uh, bar visual plotting so pressures and a and e considering this this module was written about i don't know 4 years ago now crazy that you know you know back then this was a problem obviously we've we've fixed it now anyway so we've got some demand <laughs> we've got some capacity and We've got some really shonky looking ambulances and I don't know. And, and we've got a, a person in a box. Not quite sure what that is, but I don't know. I think that's that. Is that you, Alistair? I think that's you. Okay. Anyway, so uh, we've got a data set which we loaded earlier, which is capacity AE, uh, which shows the changes in capacity in A in departments from 2017 to 2018. We need to update these, but obviously we're just using free and open source data so that we can share it. Uh, and it's also obviously uh, a little bit made up. So if we go back to our data set, uh, I flushed mine, so I haven't got it in there, which is pretty poor. But if we go back up here somewhere... Okay, look at that. It was the first one we loaded in was our capacity AE. Uh, so let's, I'm just going to be cheeky here and reload it in here. So we have a capacity AE. So make sure you do have a capacity AE object, which has got 68 observations and five variables. So let's have a look at what that is. So the object is called Capacity AE, which is a data frame, which we've already done. I don't know quite where we're going back to ourselves, but we've talked about tidy data before um, from the fabulous Happy Wickham. Do check him out. He wears the most amazing bow ties. Um, so a proper, proper data nerdy, geeky person. Um, also has the most amazing cocktail uh, collection in the world. Um, anyway, uh, so tidy data, each variable forms a column, every observation calls a row, and each cell is a single measurement. So hopefully nothing outrageously difficult there. We've, we've kind of discussed that before. Um, and yes, we can we can discuss that uh, at a later date, the difference between wide and long. And uh, if the, those joyous people kind of join me next week, we will go into long and wide a little bit more. Um, We've talked well briefly. We've seen the 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 name Tibble come up. Uh, when we use Tibble, basically we're just using data frame or data sheet or or something like that. There are some slight differences, and there are different data formats that we can use as well. Um, so R is basically written above C or C plus plus or C sharp. I don't know. Yeah, C plus plus. Um, so it obviously compiles and does various bits and pieces in there. There are some other data types and other data frame types that we can use, which potentially are more uh, more ro not known worse, more um, more quick to use and less computationally expensive. However, for most of the stuff we're doing, the data frame is is fine. Um, I work in UDAO. I've been using the elective recovery, so I've been using the data uh, from the the waiting list, and I've been throwing. What's the biggest data set that I've worked on? 
think it was 45 million rows of data with I think there's about 60 columns in it and it seems to cope with that without any problem I think it's about a 14 gigabyte file and it seems to cope with it so uh, but that's within UDAL um, I think a bit of mileage may vary um, depending on where you are so UDAL for non-NHS England people is our sort of virtual uh, desktop where we sort of run a lot of our, our bits and pieces but yeah it's quite powerful and it does allow you to chuck big stuff around uh blah. plots is where we're going so hopefully you'll go back to uh we have our data frame and we'll be able to read in our capacity ae there aren't any uh cheeky bits in the capacity ae that's what we're, there's, there's, there's no trip ups or uh, weird column names or weird data types um so if we have a look at our data frame um, if you remember how to do that, we can either click on our data frame here. We can literally type view capacity AE, or uh, you can press control and hold down control and then click on the object within the uh, uh, blah, 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 within the code. So here, if I hold control and I click on capacity AE, it does click up. It doesn't click up in the front though, which is a little bit annoying, but anyway, there we go. So just run through what our data set is. Oh, there we go. We've got another little handy tip. Uh, there's a little box here. And if you click on that, it will spit it out into a, uh, a another window, which is quite useful. And there's also a button here, which allows us to sort of apply some filters to the data. Again, it's only having a look at our view of our data. It's not actually changing the data. Um, but again, if you just want to eyeball something to make sure that it is doing what you think it's doing and that, you know, the numbers are in the, the right sort of place, um, that's quite useful. So uh, viewing the data frame, as I say, if we if we run it, it will appear in the console. But if we click on it, it will appear up here in the tab and we can see it. So all good. So do we understand the variable names and what do they mean? Uh, no, I can't remember what they are and what they mean. So let's have a look. So we've got a site number, uh, which is basically our ID of our sites, which is which is our good. We've got the number of attendances that they had in 2018. So that's just like a raw number. This is the number of uh, uh, attendances they had in 2018. Then we've got a true or false, which is our Boolean value to say, did staff numbers increase between 2017 and 2018? So have they had an increase? And then we've got the differences between the average of cubicles and the difference in waiting times between 2017 and 2018. So it's a pretty weird data set. So if anybody's got any questions on that, it just takes a little while to work out what we're doing. So ID is our site ID. So obviously we've got one row per site. We've got a number of attendances. Have our uh, staff numbers increased? And then we've got the differences between the number of cubicles and the, the waiting times. So I'm assuming what we're trying to look at, if there is a correlation in some shape or form between the increase, if there is an increase in cubicles, did that cause a decrease in waiting times, which I guess is what we're, we're trying to get to. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's exactly what we're trying to get to. That was our question, I believe, isn't it? Going back. Where is our question? There we go. Uh, da, 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 da. No, where's our question? Sorry. Uh, okay, I've lost it. Anyway, uh, anyway, that is the question that we are trying to get to. So uh, there we go. It's a nice quote about graphs. It's fine. So, oh, there's our question. Oh, stupid boy. Right, so is a change in the number of cubicles in a &E associated with a change in the length of attendance? So we would hope that if we have more cubicles available in a &E, then that would reduce our length of attendance. And what we want to do is plot a simple linear model between those two things to work out whether there is a correlation. Can we, can we see that there is a correlation or not? So we are going to plot it out. 
So what we want to do is basically is plot a, a, a scatter graph and then we're going to add sort of a, a linear model over the top of it uh, just to have a look at what that looks like. So we start with ggplot, uh, which is basically our, our code to initially start off our, our data, sorry, our, our, our coding in order to um, create our plot. So ggplot does work slightly differently from dplyr in that in, we create a basic plot and then we add things to it. So if we wanted to add a new axis label or if we wanted to add a, a line or some dots or we wanted to add a title and we want to add different colors, etc. Instead of doing a then, uh, which would be a, the, the sort of the, the pipe operator, we use a plus just to say this is our plot and then we want to add this and add this and add this and add this. So we use a plus. So more or less in the same sort of methodology, it's just a different symbol and it's only for ggplot. And don't ask me why, but there we go. So we're going to start off with our ggplot and we're going to say the data that we want to use for our ggplot is our capacity AE. So we do ggplot, data is our capacity AE. So hopefully that's nothing too strange. And then we want to add some layers to it. So obviously at the moment, if we've just got our data, ggplot goes, yep, great, I've got some data, but we want to add some points into our data. So we want to do a, we want to do a scatter plot. So we want to add, uh, and they're called geoms, uh, which is basically just geometric shapes of some description. And in this case, we want to do a point. There are various different geoms that the geom point tells us what type of graph we want to do. So if we did geom line, it would do a geom, it would do a line graph. If we did a geom hist, it would do a histogram. If we did geom violin, it would create a violin plot. Uh, if we did geom bar, it would do a bar plot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the geom underscore whatever, um, and there are a lot of whatevers, will tell us what type of chart we're going to use. Um, and then we've got our AES, which stands for our aesthetics, which is basically the, the gubbins of our plot, as in what are the bits that we need for a plot? And I guess the... For a, for a scatter plot, the absolute minimum that we need to know for our scatter plot is our X and Y uh, coordinates in order to know where to put our points. So we want to know that our X is our cubicles and our Y is our D weight. So we've got D weight and D cubicles. So at the absolute minimum, if we run that, where are we? Oh. that should give us our absolute minimum plot. So uh, that gives us our X and Y. And we can see just visually, we've got a bit of a bit of a slope, which is kind of good. That's what we want to see. Uh, we've got a few options here. As I said, we can uh, move the size of our, uh, our window here at any point, uh, which is quite nice. And it will, it will, stretch and then recalculate accordingly which is which is quite nice uh, we can also do a zoom and click on zoom which will pop it into a new window a new window again that we can click and drag and spit out uh, which is which is quite nice uh, we can also uh, export uh, and we can save it as an image we can save it as a pdf or we could copy it to a clipboard if we so wished and what's also quite nice, although we come to do it later on, if you, we wanted to create our chart and for whatever reason we wanted this really long wide chart, when I click on export and save as image, it will save it with that shape that I've put here. Uh, whereas if I, uh, so let me just show that. If I copy that to clipboard and oh my God, word. I've got word. Let's see if I can find word. Oh, no, it's not going to play, is it? No. It was in your programs there. If you went back onto your. No, I've got word. The problem is the uh, from the cloud to copy. Mm, yeah. 
I've got a cloud copy, so it's not going to work. But trust me, it will it will work like that. Um, you can also obviously specify here if you want to uh, change it and uh, uh, update preview. And obviously you can change things. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, but yeah, hopefully you get the, the idea and you can then uh, change it and copy it and, and paste it, etc. cetera, uh, which is really nice. And you can also specify within the code that I want to save it and I want it to have these ratios, etc. cetera. So that's cool. So anyway, we've got a basic plot, which is a you know great start from hopefully not a lot of code which is nice it's not the prettiest yet but you know we've uh we've only just started so nice simon hello it's got um i just trying to get that bit of code typed in and i've got an error yeah oh. you probably got a comma in the wrong place brackets do you want to share your screen and we'll have a look <clears throat> don't want to interrupt your flow too much no, no 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 i want you to interrupt flow flow needs to be interrupted uh, so it's good to see these things and pick up where we are. So, so this is a bit of code. Oh no, it did work. I had to fix it. In fact, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no talk. problem. Yes, I think I can't see what was going on. <laughs> no worries. I, I couldn't see what was going wrong either. I just hadn't rerun it. Maybe... <laughs> you'd only highlighted one line of the 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 bit that Simon was doing, so you hadn't highlighted the um the actual starting GG plot bit. You'd gone straight to the GM point, I think. Yeah, what, what you may let me share I again. Think I, do. I just think I just didn't rerun it after fixing the bracket that was missing. <laughs> My bad. No problem. Oh, no, that's the wrong button. I must press leave then. Like, right, I've had enough. I'm out of here. No, I mean, you might have just done that, but that's pretty. I don't know. That's a. I, I was missing the final bracket, and then I, I added the bracket. I could still see the error message, but of course, I hadn't rerun the code. So. Ah, yeah, you, know, you got to rerun the code to make the code rerun. That's, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's. That's fair. Um, right. So where are we? We are uh, we are there. So we've got something. So choices. Uh, there we go. Yeah, pie charts. You can do pie charts in R. Obviously, we don't do pie charts in R, but you can. Uh, so we could got lots of choices now that we can add to our chart. We could we could change the the shape of our data points. So at the moment we've got little dots. Do we want squares? Uh, do we want to? Yeah, do we want to make them round? Uh, do we want to change the size of them? So all of this stuff is the AES, the aesthetic attributes that we give to the geom. Good grief! Uh, do we want to change the size of it? We could change the obviously the the the, the axis type uh, position. Obviously, at the moment we've got pure X and Y. Um, but potentially, if we wanted to just add 10 to all our values, we could do. Or we could divide them by 100 or whatever. Or if we wanted to, we could uh, change them into a log or something like that. Um, although there is a much nicer way to convert stuff into log scales. But I don't know. Let's not do log scales now. Um, but yeah, you can obviously change positions of stuff. You're not purely limited to x and sort of y and obviously we can change the color and we can well we're going to do that in a second so uh, at the moment our our shape size and color is just default across across everything which is not great uh for some reason we're jumping back to functions so functions are basically words with brackets next to them which basically we, we do this and then everything within the brackets are, are what we've done which are arguments um some uh, some uh, some functions don't need any arguments, but they still need the sort of open close brackets. So uh, I don't know my classic example is sys dot date doesn't need any uh, doesn't need any input, but it will tell me what the the system date is, um, and it knows it's today, which is awesome. Um, so it doesn't need any uh, it doesn't need any data to go in there, but it does need still need that sort of open close bracket uh, type stuff to go in there so um and when there are multiple 
uh, arguments that go into that function, they're all separated by commas. So we've been doing that all we've been doing that all along. So where we've done our group buys, we've done our this is that comma, this is that comma, this is that comma dot by equals. You know, so we've done all these things before. This isn't new or uh, particularly exciting. So um, you can explicitly name arguments. So where we've got our gg uh, gg plot, we've got our gg plot data equals capacity AE. You don't have to explicitly name them. So you can just do gg plot capacity AE. And gg plot knows that the first thing that you feed into it is going to be this data. And it will just take things in the order, in a very specific order to that function that it will require and, and do. Personally, again, I think for much of the things uh, spelling them out is is going to be much much more useful um, than not spelling them out. Um, so, for instance, you could, if you were absolutely crazy, uh, do your g on point data equals capacity a e, and then write x equals dbq dbq equals y equals d weight. If you were crazy bonkers, you could write y equals d weight x equals d cubicles. Uh, but I think, personally, I would find that utterly crazy and and very, very confusing. Um, somebody told me the most, uh, I don't know for how long I have been confusing my X and Y axes. It's it's like the word select, which I can never type properly. If you ever see me write the word select, I think I avoided it earlier. That first E always disappears, which when you're a SQL user is is very challenging because it's quite common used. Uh, also, I can never remember which is X or never remember which is Y. Although somebody gave me a little mnemonic the other day, which is X is a cross. And it means that X is a cross. And now I can remember which is X and which is Y. So if you struggled, hopefully that little mnemonic will help you too. So it's not just... Hypes up. So this is the teen teenager being helpful. It's Y to the sky. Tell him it. Tell him it. Y to the sky. Why to no. I have no idea why. Y to the sky. No, I, that doesn't work. Right, for me. Brain works. No. But if it works for him, that's great. But I don't know. Whatever works for you is oh. it is <laughs> fantastic. So what we could do, uh, let's say we we could do it in a named argument. Um or potentially we could do it in a non-named argument. So uh, it's taking that order where X goes first, Y seconds. We could do GG plot, capacity AE, G on point, cubicles, D weight. Personally, I find it much more readable to, to have that X equals Y equals and, and potentially data equals two. I mean, that one probably doesn't, but but me spelling out my X and Ys is, is really important especially when it comes on to later things when I want to remember if I want to change my X label then I can look back up and go oh yeah X label refers to my D cubicles okay excellent that's great otherwise I can never remember which one is is which so that would be really good um we will go through some other geoms uh at, at the end but there's other geoms that we can do there's like bars there's lines there's box plots there's histograms all of these just work straight out of the out of the box and affect your data. So if you're ever trying to do a histogram in uh, in Excel, you have to calculate all your uh, all your probabilities and everything. You have to kind of manually do it and then create the histogram. Geom histogram will just do it off the bat, and I think we'll do some in a minute. Uh, same with box plots. You just say, "Here's my data." here's my data distribution create me a box plot and it just will you know it, it does all the calculations for you uh which is which is fabulous uh and you can also mix and mix and match up, up to a point uh and so if you've got like a, a geom bar chart and you want to add in like error bars uh, for your know, like min and max values over the last 12 months or something like that uh you can you can do all of those sort of things so you can sort of really layer stuff up uh, one thing you can't do, I say you can do it, but you can't do it easily, is have multiple access charts. Mainly because multiple multiple access access charts are really evil and wrong, and don't ever do them. The the only place you should ever use a multi access chart is on a Pareto chart. Anywhere else, it's a it's a it's a 
It's tantamount to a 3D pie chart in my mind. It's one of those absolute no-nos. If you want to show the correlation between two things, plotting two things on separate axes is not how you do it. <laughs> um, you know, that is really, really bad practice and really bad statistically, really bad data visualization wise. So please don't use dual axis charts. It's uh, one of my bugbears. My other bugbears is spark lines, which I'll go into at another point. Um, but anyway, uh, yes, sorry, ranty mode off. Right, <laughs> clearing charts. So uh, in this one, what we want to do is add in a, a, a geon smooth, which is basically going to give us a, a linear uh, regression line onto our plot. So we're going to start off with our current plot, which is our GG plot, uh, which is our data and our capacity. And then we're going to add in another layer, which is going to be uh, a geom smooth. Um, is that? Does it do? I can't remember if what that does it. Does it do a lowest line or does it do it? I can't remember what the default is. So, uh, Geom Smooth is going to give us a smoothing line between cubicles and weight. So, hopefully, we can just copy that. Copy that second line. change that to smooth I know it does use the lowest line okay so uh yeah not ideal that it uses lowest as its uh, default which is we'll change that in a minute so lowest is a least oh, good grief I should have remembered what it is. It's a locally weighted regression line, which means it's a very, very clever polynomial uh, regression line and is quite difficult to interpret. And I think it comes out of odds ratios rather than p-values and doesn't give a straightforward linear slope relationship. Whereas I think we have got a relatively straightforward linear slope relationship here. So what I would like to do is convert that into a, a more linear model, which I believe is what we do next. Uh, so, yeah, there we go. We've got that. However, we want to do a, a linear model. So we're going to add in, and again, this is going to be cheeky about where we put it in our brackets. So we want to put a comma between our end brackets and add in model equals LM. And then that gives us a linear model. Uh, Don't worry about the bit I'm doing now, unless you are really into your regressions. Uh, So, as I said uh, probably earlier, is that R is statistical software at heart. That is its kind of base. So, I want to create a summary of a linear model uh, of D weight to cubicles. And now, if I want to, there we go, we've done a call. Now, if we want to actually have a look at the fit of this model, it will uh, tell us much more, much more exciting stuff. So, we can see what our residuals are. We can have a look at our coefficients. So that we can see we've got a p-value of way less than 0 0.5, so that we uh, 0 0.05. So we can see there is a significant correlation between these things, and we have got a more, uh, adjusted R squared of 0.4. So there's pretty good correlation between these two uh, results. However, we do have some outliers, so which are quite clear over here. So something's going on. We've got a couple of outliers. But uh, we can obviously, this has got our, where are we? Have I done it the right way around? No. Is that? 
Sorry, I might have done these. So that one there, and that one's D weight. Oh no, I was right. So I was trying, I was looking at the wrong bit, wasn't I? There we go. Sorry. So yeah, we can see that we have got an intercept of 31, which is uh, about here, which is about right. And we do have, yeah, that's all good. Anyway, so, and we do have a sort of a, a, an estimate of for each additional, let me get this right, each additional cubicle, we have an estimate that that reduces weight by not by 1.1. So that basically that's what that linear model is going into. I'm not going to do massive amounts of stats for you now, but just to show that rather than just adding in a linear trend, actually understanding what that linear trend is really, really important. And again, oh, I'm full of bugbears. Uh, one of my massive bugbears is people clicking on that linear trend button in Excel no matter what data you come up with, if you click that button, it's going to come up with a line. Whether that line is statistically significant or not, it's going to splot a line on it. So actually understanding what the model means is really important. So don't click on that linear trend if you don't understand what a linear regression is, please. Anyway, um, moving on, let's get on to some different bugbears. Simon's a rant mode. Anyway, that gives us a nice linear trend. Anyway, but we do see that we have a couple of cheeky outliers who do appear to be not like the others so what is going on here that is our question so hypothesis uh two sites have seen staffing increases we can map point color to the staff increase variable to see to find out so basically we're going to add a color to our chart now so we're going to color in those that have had a staff increase differently to the plots that we haven't. So excuse me, I'm just uh, uh, belching crazily in the background here. So sorry about that. Hopefully that didn't come through loud and clear on the recording. Cut that bit out, that'd be fine. Anyway, so what we're going to do is add into our aesthetics is a colour to our plots. And we're going to base that colour on the staff increase. So where we've got a, a staff increase, we've got a true and false value. So it'll colour all the trues for one colour and all the falses another colour. So again, we want to include this within our aesthetic. So this is in with our, within before our double bracket, bra bleh, brackets here on our geon points. So we're not colouring them in on the smooth because the smooth is just a line. We're going to add this into our points. And our colour equals our staff increase. So our staff increase is that true false value in our data set. So let's go back here. Uh, so we want to go so carefully. We want to still do it within our double brackets here, whereas before we did it outside. So we'll come to that in a minute, the difference between inside and outside brackets. So if we run that one now, a couple of things have happened. So A, we've got a, a true and false. Uh, we've got we've now got a, an extra sort of legend appear automatically for us, and we've also coloured in these these outliers. So we can see, I guess, that broadly the outliers are on this side of the line, although not all, and our significant outliers are definitely on on this side of the line. So would appear that uh, having a staff increase does help you uh, reduce waiting times, um, which is crazy, I know. Uh, who'd have thought it? Uh, maybe somebody should tell somebody up in, uh, in, in Portland land that that is the case. So uh, that's that's one thing that we could do. Um, we could, uh, uh, yeah, we could also have changed in size or shape uh, if we wanted to. So blah, 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 blah. So important distinction. So here we did color equals red, and we've done it within the uh, the the side here. So we've done it with. If we did going back to our code here, we could do color equals, and we could type oh, red. 
if I can spell the word red. Oh, and handily, uh, our studio tells me what red looks like. Uh, if we run that, it will make everything red. So now it's not based on a variable, it's just flat out red. Uh, what we could do is change that back. Ooh, there we go. And we could change that to, uh, God, what's it called? It's, it's not called size anymore, is it? It will tell me what it's called. I'm sure. Uh, anyway, no, no, it's right. So now we've got a size based on the discrete variable. Uh, R is throwing a wobble at me. Or give me it's not wobbling at me. It's giving me a warning to say that size for discrete variable is not advised. And yep, I totally agree. So now if I, uh, outside of my, so if I put my, uh, where are we? Color. No, uh, sorry. Uh, where are we? We are doing, what are we doing? We are doing color, aren't we? Yep. Uh, color equals red. That's still going to color everything to red. Uh, but the staff, inc but the size will be dependent upon the, the staff increase. So if you want something that's dependent upon the variables, et cetera, you need to put it within this AES bit. If you want something that's just going to affect globally, then you would put it outside. You probably would want that the other way. And we would do size equals, I don't know, uh, three and see what that looks like. Uh, still looks, yeah, maybe that's okay. Maybe we'll want bigger blobs we could make bigger blobs and then that's affects things globally so if you want something to be sort of dynamic and change to the data you put it within that uh aes bit so as we can see this aes contains all of these areas but the size bit is outside of the aes and it fits within yeah fits it fits here as a separate thing outside the aes hope that makes sense but do come back to it if there's there's any issues um so yeah i think we've done that um so to avoid duplication uh we can also feed in the common aesthetics into our data set rather than spelling them out each time so we can feed our aesthetics into our gg plot here and if that is going to just be shared across everything else, we don't then have to spell out our X and Y each time. So let me just show you. And I am going to call them X and Y because I still think that's nicer. So if we do uh, that, and we're still going to do X equals and Y equals. Uh, Let's just put that over here so that's a little bit cleaner because i've already specified what are x and i don't have to specify x and y in each layer i've specified them at the top and that's just going to follow through so that's just going to run through it's going to give me a lowest line again because i've not specified but if i wanted to change the method then that would be the only thing that i would have to fit into my smooth because that's the only thing that's sort of different now and then then that's given me a, a, a linear model there so again that just makes that plotting quite nice and and easy um don't know whether just trying to think this probably is not suitable it's just gonna be an absolute mess what's this gonna do uh Yay, look at that. Um, <laughs> you can obviously, if, it were, if we wanted to do something, obviously this is not a time series, but obviously if we did have more of a time series there and we wanted to do points and we want to do lines, then you can add all those in there. So yeah, let's just remove that. So uh, that's sort of one bit of plotting. Let's try some other bits. So this is wonderful, uh, amazing bit of small multiples magic. And we probably need to do a much better example of this because facet wrap is one of the most amazingly super clever brilliant things in the world ever um so 
we're going to take on the plot that we had. We're going to add a facet underscore wrap, and we're going to use this tilde symbol, which uh, we probably haven't used yet before. So if you look next to your return key, uh, above hash, so shift and hash, is a little squiggly thing there, and it's called a tilde, uh, which is T-I-L-D-E. Don't know why it's called that, but that is what it is called. And not going to necessarily explain what it does because it's, yeah, you, it, it, you don't use it a lot. Um, but yeah, it's, it's I'm just trying to think. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, just, just take it on, on, on faith, as it were, that uh, we, we're using tilde. We will use it some more when we do the intermediate R and we use some case statements and things that might make a little bit more sense there. But we're just going to do a very simple use case here. So we're going to use small multiples of magic. So if we look at our just data here and we do our geom plot and we just run this one, we're just going back to our old school facet, uh, our old school uh, um, original plot. So hopefully that's all right. Now what we want to do is a facet wrap and it's based on staff increase. So now if we run this, what it does is basically gives us two charts, one based on uh, all our falses and one based on all our trues. And it's basically given us uh, a, a plot for each, uh, which is just phenomenal. Going, uh, oh my goodness, what have we got? Uh, so potentially, if you've got the same plot that you want to run over different teams or you want to run over different regions or ICBs, et cetera, you can have all that same data, but you can do a separate plot for each one. So, and it will it will produce a separate plot for each one. Let me see if I can find an auth, uh, try to come up with an example. So we've got beds data, haven't we? Well, oh my goodness me, that's going to be way too much. Uh, what have we got? What else do we do? We've got capacity, no, capacity AE. What else do we do? That was just those, wasn't it? All right. Uh, what's in bed today? Uh, did we have a shortened version? We did. Uh, beds Bradford. Okay, that's. Uh, we're. Chester Cheyenne. Yeah. Right, so I've got three in my new data frame. So I want to do GG plot data equals that and plus geom point. What have we got in here? Uh, AS X equals AES X equals date, Y equals uh, beds, have plus G on line. Should have put that above. That's great. There. What doesn't it like? There we go. So that's given me some weird stuff plus that's it. Right. Uh, what was it all name? I spell Worcestershire wrong, but I did. Anyway, had you had I spelt it correctly, it would have spat out free charts for me. And you can do it over multiple million mega, uh, as many as you want. So I could do it over the whole beds data. That's going to go absolutely bonkers. It's not beds, beds data. And that's going to give me a facet of 
4,000 odd charts, which I probably shouldn't have just run because that's very silly. Uh, yes, I'm telling me lots of errors and warnings. Right, I'm just going to move on while that's running, but essentially it's going to create 4,000 mini charts for me. Uh, it might just give up, hopefully. Um, so anyway, so Facet is fabulous because you can just create out of one data set, create lots of mini charts. So absolutely no excuses for creating spaghetti charts because let's not make spaghetti charts because spaghetti charts are awful. You know, it's much better to have them side by side and actually see what's going on individually. So uh, we can also do uh, n col equals one, which basically says our facets instead of side by sides, put them into one column and then we've got um, uh, uh, one column. We can also do other things within the facets. If you've got wildly different um, scales for your for your charts, you can tell them to have separate scales if if needs be. Although that's a little bit dangerous to do. So if people are sort of comparison because it sort of standardizes everything, uh, but you can do those. You're implicit, and you can do lots of other things with those. Um, that's really nice. So. Uh, as I said, we've not polished and, and tidied up our charts or done much of the sort of the prettier stuff, and we will sort of come to that in a minute. Um, so let's have a look at how our weight values are distributed. So let's do a, a very basic histogram, uh, which is quite good. So we take our GG plot, and we're going to take our data capacity AE, and we're going to do a histogram on our D weight. Obviously, we've only got uh, an X for a histogram. There's, there's no Y. Um, it is purely looking at the distributions of, of X. So we only need to do X equals. Let's see if this has what an over. No, there we go. I've got my 4,000 odd mini plots of which you can't see, which is not very useful. Uh, yeah, let's get rid of those. So let's go back to here. So we want to do data is capacity AE, and I would spell out still X equals D weight, but that's me. And just because, and that's given us a very basic um, histogram. Um, obviously, it's just determined from itself um, that bins are 30, and it's just arbitrarily decided that based on some very basic calculations of, of whatever. Uh, we can change that if we want. So if we want bin width uh, to be more uniform, um, it's not part of the aesthetics. It's outside of the aesthetics. So again, this is another example. of. So the aesthetics is all about the actual plots. Like if we wanted to change the color of the histogram or if we wanted to uh, I don't know, you can't really change the shape of it, but if we wanted to change the color of it, then we would um, uh, we, we would do that. So, but actually we just want to change the number of bins that we've got or the, or the bin width. So let's change that and add in. So again, between our brackets and that sits outside our aesthetics and that gives us much chunkier bins. And obviously if we wanted far less chunky bins, we could, uh, let's change it to 50. And that also gives us, and that is even more chunky bins. What am I doing? Uh, if I wanted less chunky bins, I could do could do that. Um, so that is one way of looking at it is is via histogram. Uh, another way we could look at the same sort of. Oh no, we're not going to go there. We're, maybe we'll come on that to the end. So uh, let's go on to another topic, and we'll come back to the histogram because I think we do um, a, a, a box plot in a minute. So let's just carry on with this. Uh, number of attendances by site. So we want to do a bar plot, which is obviously one of our other favorite type of plots that we want to do. So we want to take our GG plot. We want to do our data, our capacity AE, and we want to do our site, and we want to do our attendance at 2018. So um, pretty much as it says on the tin. So let's just take that. Change that to is it bar. Are we doing bar? I think we're doing bar. Are we doing column? So it's different. Now we're doing column. And we want... Uh, I keep forgetting site and attendance. 
site and y equals what's it called attendance twenty eighteen. And that gives us a uh, beast of a chart, which is not very pretty or helpful, but it's a start. So uh, if we're doing a bar chart or a column chart, it's always good to reorder our data because it's not going to be, uh, you know, we, we haven't got cats, we haven't got categories historical data, so we should always reorder from sort of high down to low. Uh, so let's have a look at, we can do that. So we can reorder our sites based on the attendance. So we can do this within our code here. Uh, so let's do that. So we can do reorder site by Attendance 2018. And then that gives us uh, sort of a graph going that way. What we can do is also do that. There we go. And spin it around backwards. Uh, and we can also zoom that out. And if we make it a little bit bigger, sorry, I'll push back to the code in a minute. That starts looking. A little bit prettier ish. So I put a minus on there, which is kind of the same as where we did the ascending, descending um, stuff earlier. So it's just reordered by the minus of the attendance, which means it splits around the other way. If we wanted to, um, let's say, you know, we can absolutely do. Uh, this is where it all gets messy. We could swap our X's and Y's over and make that one X and make that one Y. And I need another comma. And I think I'm there now. Oh, what have we got? Oh, I need another bracket. There we go. Oh, and we could not make that minus that way. And yeah, potentially, maybe with not so many uh, sites, that's starting to look a little bit better. Uh, we could. Also, if we wanted to, if we remember, we could color equals attendance 2018. That starts giving it a little bit of a uh, little bit of niceness on there. Uh, we could, what else could we do? Obviously, we could change our labels. We could highlight specific rows if we wanted to. So we could base that color uh, based on something else entirely, uh, uh, if, if if we so wish. So let me just double check. I mean, we're using the capacity AE. So we've got our, what have we got? We've got our staff increase. So if we do that, There we go. Not perfect, but now we've highlighted those uh, areas where we've got a staff increase, uh, which probably might look better when we zoom it out and make it look. Ugh. It's come out with nasty default colors, uh, and but we, we can change those. That's that's you know absolutely not a problem. Like I so said, everything is up for grabs. But you know you can see that I've managed to just on the fly highlight those. Uh, another thing that we can do is I hate the. The gray background we can add a theme to our graph uh, and as you can see the whole bunch of themes that we could just add as standard i'm a great big fan of theme minimal 
which just removes some of that grayness from from the background uh and yeah just tidies things up a little bit um if we wanted to this is probably a really bad example to it but we could label each of our um uh, of our columns and actually have the 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 y value on each of our columns again this has got way too many columns to be able to do that but we we absolutely could do that um and then remove all our x-axis uh, and remove all our labels and sort of start making a really sort of much more minimalist and you know uh, impactful graph um and there is a fabulous document uh by the government i think it's yeah i think it is a government sort of data visualization guide which really shows how to sort of strip out a lot of the unnecessary ink of of, of chartage and you know you, how you should plot values directly onto a bar chart get rid of the the, the you know values in the on the x axis and also use color to actually highlight what you're trying to say rather than just presenting here's all your stuff yeah do do whatever you want uh, and as I said, there's that really nice way you can add annotations and, and things to, to graphs as well. So uh, we will get to that. Well, we won't get to that today. Uh, that's extra homework. So anyway, we've <laughs> we ordered by attendance. Sorry, I'm off on one at the moment. If anybody's stuck or got a problem, please do, do shout. So uh, let's do a box plot. Again, traditionally, if I was using Excel, I think you even have to, I think it has got a function for it now. Although I'm remembering back in the day when I first started using box plots, you kind of had to create a bar plot and you'd have to calculate all your quartiles separately. And then you had to color in your bar plot uh, like transparent in order to make it work. And goodness knows. Yeah, absolute nightmare. So this should work off the same data set that we did our histogram on. So pretty much copy and paste that i know we have got stuff we created i know we've added a d weight in this as well so we have got a y um so there we go we have got a y if we didn't have y it would plot it all into one so uh so this creates us a box plot with true and false for the d weights if i didn't have d weight in there it would just plot it across the ooh, uh, hold on, why has it still got that in there? That's I oh know staff increase. I've deleted the wrong wing. I delete staff increase. There we go. It would just plot the whole lot. Weirdly, it sends it sideways if you do it that way. Uh, sorry, there we go. Uh, so yeah, if we got staff rates, so now we can see the distributions between the staff increase to and false. And we can see for sure where we've got a, a, a staff increase. We have definitely got a lower mean and we can see our quartiles are considerably considerably lower and, and, and different uh, around our box plot. And again, if we wanted to add our, you say, I don't I don't like the look of those, but I don't like that green gray background. So I'm going to add in my theme minimal. And that's starting to look a little bit prettier. There are other other themes available. And there are whole, whole, whole sets of um, themes that you can download. Um, we, if you go onto the NHS R community website, it will pink you to a Google, uh, sorry, a GitHub account, and there is a sort of a theme NHS where it tries where possible to use sort of NHS color schemes, etc. So uh, uses the applicable color schemes for for the NHS, etc. Okay, I need to get through this bit so we can get on to our break. So uh, that's a Geon box plot. Um, if we wanted to add in some labels to our chart, uh, we can just add in the Geon uh, label, so not Geon labels, a, a labs function, and we can change the title and we can change the X axis. So uh, let's do that. Uh, where are we? Do changing the staffing effect. Uh, what's it waiting times? And then we can see that now I've got that as my title. That's my waiting. And I can also change my x axis as well if I want. Uh, x equals staff 
Increase. False. True. And that would obviously change that, that at the bottom there. So everything, but everything is up for grabs within a, a GG plot. I cannot explain just how much you can tweak uh, around to the, the scales that it shows. If you want it to show every 10 rather than every 50. Uh, if you uh, say so you want to put annotations in there, you can do all of that. Uh, if you want to change colors, you want to do fill, you know, you want to fill these in and make them a, a little bit more colorful. That's entirely possible. So we can add that in there. Uh, really nice thing. If we want to change it from a box plot to a violin plot, we can just literally change box plot to violin. And that will create us some, some violin plots, which uh, are, again, quite a nice way of, of, of showing distributions in a much a, a little bit more nuanced way than a, a, a box plot does so we can see there is definitely a, a, a thing and you know potentially there's nothing stopping us from doing both uh let's see not sure if that way around is going to work very well yeah there we go Ugh horrible uh so we can't see what's underneath there so let's change our equals 0.5 no is it alpha never remember alpha equals 0.5 there we go so alpha is the transparency of it so i managed to make it a little bit more transparent um and and uh, color let's do Color equals staff increase. Oh, that's changed the, the outside border. That's probably not ideal. Uh, fill. I um, hope it's fill. Make that staff increase. What that look like? There we go. Look at that. So we can start. Hopefully, so you, you just see that you can start building up some some relatively funky things. Uh, we could do something like uh, geom jitter. Let's do that as well. There we go. And we can see all our data points in a in a sort of weird, funky way to see where everything is all distributed. So hopefully you can see, and we have nowhere near enough time to go into the full ins and outs of everything, how quickly, once you kind of get the hang of things, how you can just tweak pretty much everything and just build stuff on the fly and make some really nice data visualizations. Um, I mean, I don't think you could do something like that in Excel very easily, um, and let alone sort of BI or, or, or whatever would, would be challenging on that. So, you know, that is a relatively reasonable distribution chart. If I go back to our histogram, you can change that quite nicely to uh, density. And that will give you a you know a nice density plot really really quickly and easy around our distribution. Sorry, we're going off on a tangent. Stay on focus, Simon. Where are we? Right. So, um, really really nice. We've added some plot labels. We've done a box plot. As always, please shout. It's late in the day. I'm probably wibbling. Uh, so save a plot. We can do a GG save and spit things out into a, a PNG and we can just save it as an image. However, we are gonna have a quick break and then what we're going to do is basically pull together a bunch of the stuff we've done throughout the day. And I'm just gonna show you the very, very basics of Quarto, which is basically how we can pull some data in. We can do some very, very quick wrangling. We're just gonna copy some stuff we did earlier. We're gonna plop it into a chart and then we're gonna produce a report uh, which will look very pretty and we'll be able to send that out. I will then show you um, some of the, here's one I prepared earlier around potentially uh, other things that you can do in in Quarto. Um, 
Porto is really nice in that it spits out HTML outputs. Those HTML outputs, even though they open up in a browser, they are standalone documents. You can attach them to an email. They're not linked to the web. It's a, a, it is standalone. Although there are features within the documents which can connect up to the web, but I'll explain that in, in a minute. Um, but it means that you can either send out really nice static reports. You can also send out really dynamic reports. It means that somebody can open it on their phone and they will be able to read it. You know, it's it's not like a, you know an Excel report or, or PowerPoint or anything. It will dynamically change because it's all written in HTML5, so it will uh, adjust accordingly. And you can also add interactive elements into it, which I think I sort of mentioned earlier. Not going to go into the sort of full details of Quarto. There are very specific courses on Quarto that we can pick up at another point. But it's just the case of, by, like I say, by the end of today, I wanted you to be able to load this and do some wrangling, do some plots, and uh, spit out a report. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, that's how you can save a report, uh, save a plot if you wish to. Um, when we do our quarter report, we don't need to worry about saving these sort of things. Um, R does also have functions in order to, if you wanted to like paste a, a, a picture or a chart into like a PowerPoint or something like that, there are packages which allow you to do that. So, you know, if you are still stuck in that sort of PowerPoint slide deck place, there are ways that, you know, you can use R to sort of automate that um and that is that section so we are going to take a 10 minute break and then that gives us hopefully like half an hour foot prepared that's where we are we're going to do that no, 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 no. right we're going to do quarter that's what we're going to do so we have uh we've we've imported some data we have wrangled some data we've making making some charts but what we would like to do now is produce a, a little report and have it as a, a nice reproducible analytical pipeline where we are assuming that whatever SQL or whatever it is that we've written to sort of pull the data or whatever our data source is refreshing and we are just updating our report and it's just pulling through uh, as as required uh, without us having to, to, to update stuff. So we are going to create a quarter report. So we are going to go up to our little uh, green plus side here. And that gives us various different options. And what we want to do is a quarto document. So up here on our little green plus uh, under our script, we've got quarto document. And that will uh, open up a new thing. So we want to do uh, AE uh, attendance. I can't spell attendance report. Uh, let's put my name in anyway. And this also gives us various different uh, options around what we want to do. Um, we can, we've got HTML. We can point out which is the preferred choice uh, because, as I said, it has all those lovely uh, you know, options to, to resize and uh, reduce stuff um it's it's portable it's a government recommended method we shouldn't be using pdfs or uh or whatever it's an open source platform uh and it allows us to use things like alternative text and things within our charts and tables um and to do nice things like that so hml is is recommended uh we can do pdf uh we can do word um there is also options for presentations. So if we did go into presentations, uh, we can also output directly as a, as a PowerPoint if we so wished, although um, it's a, a little bit more challenging to do so. Um, but there is also some other stuff like such as Reveal.js, which is what the slides I've been showing have been written in. Uh, and it's really quite a nice, easy language or nice, easy to create a quarto document and then spit it out into slides. Um, and again, literally, if you go into the NHS uh, GitHub page, there's all the code which made the slides. So it's not just the slides available, the code that made the slides is available as well. Uh, so all that nice little bit where I've got all those nice little copy and paste bits that I can pull out are all part of that. Uh, and also we've got like um, potentially um, shiny or observable JS, which I'm not going to go massively into now. 
Um, but yeah, um, Shiny is more of a server-based um, uh, a process. So if you want to make actual dashboards and things, Shiny is what you need. However, it does need a server um, instance. Uh, it allows you to create yeah that sort of big dashboarding thing. As yet, you would need that sort of server installed. As yet, NHS England doesn't have a Shiny server, and not very many places uh, do. Um, so, but however, within NHS England, we are fighting for one and trying to get one. Anyway, going back to where we were, we're going to do document, and we want a HTML document, and we want to create. So that will just chug through a little bit. That's weird. Okay. Okay, and it's given me uh, a sort of a preview of some docu document. If you go up to here where it says source, um, click on that and it will take you more to the actual source code of, of the report. Um, and when you create one for the first time, it comes out with um, sort of just some dummy data in there just so you can have a look at what's, what's going on. So... Uh, code runs slightly different in in quarto and there's sort of a couple of parts of it uh and I'll, I'll show you in a second so essentially there is our code uh which obviously we've been doing all day so you're really familiar with that there's markdown language which you're probably going what the heck is that that sounds really weird markdown is kind of a, a again it's like an open source uh text editing or, or text formatting language uh, it's really simple um, and as I say it's sort of free and open source and it allows you to do sort of text formatting in, in, in a in a clean and easy way um, and then the final bit of our report is the YAML uh, which don't ask me why it's called that and if you google what does YAML stand for um, you'll get 500 uh, different results I think it's one of those weird computer geek jokes around what it means and i don't think anybody really knows apart from somebody somewhere uh so anyway so if we look at our let's just run our document first so there's two different bits of uh, of uh, of markdown uh sorry of of the the quarter document there's well there's three bits so there's the yaml there's markdown and there's r let's just render it first and then we'll come back to it so we click on the render button uh, so we've got a new button now which says render the current document and basically what that does is takes all the text takes all the car R code runs the R code spits out any any sort of outputs from there and renders it all into one document uh, old school if you used um our markdown which was like the precursors to um to to uh quarto it was called knit and there was a little icon with a ball of string and some knitting needles uh, but now we we render. So if we click on render, it will ask us to save it. So uh, intro uh, quarto report and save. And it will just chug through and open out in a new window our little report. So we haven't got much in there at the moment. Uh, in fact, we've got nothing uh, apart from a little title and some some headings, etc. So our report's not looking great at the moment, but it's a it's a start. Uh, so we've got AEE attendance report. We've got quarter. We've got code. So this is what the end result sort of spits out like. But we haven't got anything anything nice in there yet at the moment. So let's go back to our posit cloud. And we want to mess about with some of this stuff. So let's just delete all of this top stuff here because we don't want that. And I find it's better to start. Oh, my goodness me. That's nice. Oh, it's gone to sleep again. Let's try it again. Do, 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 do. So how I generally uh, 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 blah, uh, format my quarter documents is that I will write all my code, create all my charts and tables and everything and have them all built and that's in one section. And then I will have separate sections when I start interlacing that with my actual report and, and my code. So I'm gonna start off with 
just changing my title for my AE attendance report because I can have spaces and I can I can put that in there. And so we don't want to echo our code. So the first thing we want to do is an echo false. And we also want to do a hash. And if you go shift in your left hand shift key, there's the up and down arrow. And we want to do warning is false. So we want to copy those in there which basically will suppress, it will mean that we're not sharing our code in our report. I mean, you can do, if you do echo is true or just not leave the echo out there, when we run our report, it will show our R code in the report. However, the end user probably doesn't want to see it. Um, so let's not share it. Um, so, and also um, we want to suppress our warning messages because when we load up things like the tidyverse, it's going to come up with some issues around the um, uh, the, the 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 differences between the um, the stuff, and it will it will fail. And um, also, it's worth knowing that when we run a quarto report, it runs all the code from scratch in a brand new clean environment. So if I, for instance, in this environment over here, I assign a variable as a equals, uh, sorry, a is free, and I've got a value here of a as, as free. When I run my quarter report, it will not see a is free. Doesn't know. It's starting from complete scratch. And likewise, it won't be able to see this data. We've got to feed it into this individual quarter report. Additionally, it won't even see uh, libraries for, for the first when, when you do. Them. So we need the first thing we need to do is call in our library, which we're going to use uh, tidyverse. So that will be our first thing that we will need to pull in. Uh, and then we're going to have to load in our data. So which is back up here and we're just going to nick our capacity AE data. data. Is that what we've been using? No, bed status. What have we been using for our plots? Bed stator, isn't it? Is it beds or? No, it is capacity AE. Yeah, so let's load in our capacity AE data set. So that's our first bit is load in library. In data. So let's, uh, what have we got? What's our favorite plot? I mean, my plot there is quite pretty. I have one. Oh, that's not, I didn't do that. So yeah, then I'm going to have my plot. I'll pop that in the chat if you want to steal it. Uh, where are we? Where's, this, where's the chat on? Chat's over here. Really. Anybody wants to steal that chart, they're more than happy. There you go. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give my plot, take my plot and turn that into an object. So plot uh, box bio. So now if I run that data, ooh, what have we got there? I don't want that one. Uh, so if I run that now, uh, it doesn't spit it out. It doesn't show it, although I've already got it there. Let me just clean that. If I run that now, it's not here. Instead, now I've got a data object. Again, like my data frame is a data object. It's a name, so I've got my capacity AE is a data object. I've now got box, a plot box bio. And if I just run that on its own, that creates my chart. So now I've called that chart box plot via uh, plot box via. That's really hard to say. Um, so I can now put that where I want it within my chart. Um, what else? What else did we do? Did we do some wrangling on capacity? AE? I can't remember. Uh, where are we? Uh, I know it's all the bed stuff we did all the wrangling on, wasn't it? Damn it. Uh, so. Let's do some random wrangling. 
Uh, where's that gone? Did I change it? If I do, I sh Ugh. That's weird. Wait, let me just do. Right, so that's my plot. I've got my data. What's in my data? Maybe uh, if I just filter it to, I don't know, those that are true. Well, I'm going to shut down my intro to R because that's just getting in the way and shutting that one. Uh, right, so I've got my uh, staff ink is my capacity AE and filter staff increase equals true. There we go. That gives me seven observations. There we go. And I just want to pop that into a little table. I'm going to remove and I'm going to remove where it says staff increase is true. Uh, so remember how to do that. And I want to do select, select staff increase. And I want to put a minus at the start of it. So let's do it. There we go. So I've got a little table, which I'm just going to chuck into my report. Um, I also want to just have a little bit of the dynamic text to go with my uh, box plot today. Um, what have we got in the data set? To say... I don't know what the highest attendances were and the lowest attendances were. So let's just create some variables which have got just the numbers from the highest and lowest, which I'm going to use a little tiny bit of base R, but it's probably good to see it so that you can um, uh, kind of understand how that works. So I want to do um, min, uh, min of, what is it, attendance. I don't know what they're called now. What was it? Uh, min, min attend. Attendances equals uh, the min of capacity AE and then dollar sign and then the column name that I want to bring through. So a bit like when we were using min, uh, mean and median, it's just another function. So min, it's just a minimum function. We could have chucked that into our summary, uh, summarize earlier. But basically, this should just return a single value for me, um, assuming, yeah, there we go. So the dollar sign just says that I want of capacity AE and dollar sign this column which if you look here, we've got capacity AE, and that's kind of what these dollar sign here is to say, these are my different columns. So if I wanted the minimum of, I don't know, the D weight, I would put that in and that would give me that uh, minute attendances and that will change it up here. So let me just change that to do attendances and then I want my max attendances. Uh, max attendances and that's those as well um, i'm being a little bit sloppy uh because i know i haven't got any nas in my data set however it would also fall over if i didn't if I, it, same way as the mean would uh so i'm going to do my na uh remove equals true just so that i'm safe and do the same for for this one here So likewise, um, if I just did mean capacity attendances like that, whereas before it fell over because we had some missing values, it won't fall over if there aren't any missing values. So I think we taught you on a deliberately uh, wrong, you know, bad data set in order to sort of pick that up. Because that works, that works. And then as soon as we get an NA in it, it will stop working. And then you'll go, I don't understand. So I think that's why we teach you from the start. So 
what have we got we have got um we've got uh we've got some, we're loading in some data we're creating some funky crazy plot we are making a little bit of a summary table which um i will bring in another library in a second to do that and then we've got our minimum attendances and we've got our max attendances um I am going to load in another library, which we are going to have to install. So if we go to tools, install, and we want to load in something called just GT. And it's as simple as that and install. GT stands for great tables. Um, and it does what it says on the tin. It's a really great, uh, really good. I don't know what juicy juice does. That sounds awesome. Um, but yeah, it's a great uh, package for creating tables. So we are going to now call that library as well, library GT. And on our staff increase, we're just going to add in, and we're just going to add in then GT as a function, which will basically just take that. So where we had, let me just run it pre, uh, first of all, let me run GT. So that's in the uh, in the memory. Then if I run that and we look at staff ink, it just basically is going to spit it out as a little table. But what I'm doing is feeding that into a GT. So if I run that with my GT and then we look at GT, now instead of being that it spat it out into uh as you can see a much nicer prettier table uh not going to go into gt tables now because that's a world of itself say much like uh gg plot is i find gt tables is the equivalent in uh, in r for tables and you can do absolutely amazing beautiful things within gt tables and i'm a big fan of uh, of I don't know, having really nice tables with like little mini plots and understanding things, I think you can get much more out of a summary table than you can with 500 tons of, of other stuff. Anyway, so let's not go in there. So I've got myself a plot. I've got myself a little table and I've got myself some min and max attendances for my time period or whatever it is. So... um. So this is all in this weird, I don't know, I'm going to call it grey. I don't know, it's kind of half of between grey and beige. I don't know what colour it is. But anyway, and this is all our this is all our um, actual sort of code. This is our R code. What we have also is white areas, and they're split out between these back ticks. So again, another, I mean, R teaches you to go to all the corners of your keyboard. So if you go up to the top left-hand side of your keyboard, above your tab key, you'll have uh, the back tick key. Um, um, I'm going to say back, back tick, back tick before we know it. And basically, we free back ticks turns on and off um, different types of code. So as we've got white here, this is literally sort of like free text. So this is our actual code, as it were. Uh, not our code, our actual parts of our... Um, our report. I'm going to use two hashes here, and this is markdown language to say I want this as a as a second level heading. So report on, and as you see, as I type, it's turned it blue to show that it's recognised. It's a it's a report. It, it's a type of um, it's a report on. And what are we doing? Increases of staff effects on uh, an ed waiting times uh this report blah 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 obviously you can probably flesh that out a little bit more um we can do i mean let's like say markdown as i said is a is a sort of a formatting language for for, for text so we can sort of make things uh um sort of bold and all of this that and, and sort of italics and create sort of tabs and sort of contact lists. I'm not going to go through that specifically now. Uh, I'll, I'll show that in a minute. But um, let's just do a chart. So uh, chart. Uh, yeah, let's label it here. That's fine. Uh, so 
chart showing change by uh, stars increase. So let me go back up here. So I want to copy my echoes and warnings because I don't actually want to show my code. But what I do want to do is just pull through my uh, object, uh, my, my plot. Which oh, no, I, I do um, hash hash, I get a heading instead of um, the hash hash. Are you in the white bit after the three ticks? Or did you delete them all? I don't have a clue. So, okay. So is your code here in grey? No. Is it in white? Yes. Okay. So if you go right up to the top, have you still got this oh. bit? Well, yeah, yeah, I've got that bit. Yeah, you've got that bit. And then have you got a three ticks and a R bit there? Move that up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Have you got those? Yeah. So that should make it, so that should be white, and then this bit should be that grey colour. And then at the end of when you finish writing your code, you want another three back ticks. So if I do three back ticks, it then should change what below is that into white. Has that done that? That is working now anyway. It's okay. not, not quite in the right colours and things, but no matter. Okay. We'll just uh, hopefully well we'll see how it goes when we when we run it. So this is just like I say, this is just blurble free text. Then we want to insert my plot, which is which have I called it? I've called it plot box bio. So it literally having a you know, I don't have to call all the code, I can just call the name of the object and that will spit that in. Um let me save so I can write some more blurb the uh, where are we? Let's just yeah. Uh, above shows I don't know something. Uh, we can also observe the maximum attendances were, uh, and we can get a little bit funky here. We can do a, a back tick R. And then we can pull in our max attendance, which did I bring in? Did I write that? Yeah, max attendance. Uh, and we can do that. So, oh my goodness, me something. Uh, so that's like a back tick R and then space and then the, the variable that we want to bring in. And the min. Uh, number of attendances was, and we can do back tick R min uh, attendance. Oops. So that's it. Those are that's in between back ticks, and we can so we can incorporate within our text. We can pull in like dynamic variables from elsewhere, which again, this is a very 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 quick and dirty way of doing it. Um, I'll talk about coffee and code later, but there's a much, much neater way of of doing it, uh, which I will, sh which I've did a whole sort of show and tell on in, in another area. But this is going to be quick and dirty. It will, it will do it. Um, and then we've got our little table, haven't we? Which is a table of uh, what is it? Just um, increased stuff. And then likewise, we just want to copy, just copy that again. I know I'm going crazy fast. I'm sorry. I will pop this entire lot of code into the chat in a minute. So you can just copy and paste it in there and, and just see how it works. Um, I know it's not plot box bio. We want, what do we want? Staff Inc. was my little table, I called it. So that's my that's my staff ink, which is my plot, uh, table over here, and then this report created on. And let's just do a very simple uh, sys dot date open close. So whoa, let's just see how I get on if I try to run this. Blimey. It's got to fail. It can't work first time. 
Yeah, there we go. Cystate. What? Why got cystate wrong? This got. Oh, capital S. Look at that. How could I do that? Uh, right, let's try that again. I will go much slower and I will pop it up into the um <laughs> on the screen while I talk to him. So there, there we go. Um I've now got a nice little funky-ish report going on, which hopefully you can see doesn't look too bad. Uh ooh, we've got some funky stuff here going on. It's it's put them into scientific notation for some reason, because I think they were massively uh let's just change that then because that's ugly and horrid. Um, well, that's very weird it's done that. Anyway, and, and then we can see... That's really odd. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, and then we can see this. And as you can imagine, if our data then got refreshed, it's just going to run all that processes over that data and just will update automatically. Likewise, you know, report created on, that's just going to update as, as we go. So... Let me pop all of the code for that into the chat in case you got stuck, because I'm sure you may have. Um, so where are we? No, I want to meeting call. Oh, there we go. Does that? Oh, my message is too long. Damn it. Uh, so let me do it piece by piece, chunk by chunk. So let's copy that bit in. And then, well, let me do that bit. Well, let me do it in two. There we go. Should do it in two. So if you copy both of those after your YAML, I've not messed with that. That should be the same for you. That should, touch wood, pop you out uh, a, a nice little report. We can also do some nice things with it. Uh, so, not that one. Uh, I'll be that one. So, has anybody got any? Has that horribly failed for anybody? Sorry, my dog is downstairs woofing to go out. I will be back in two seconds. Hopefully, that's all worked. Oh. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. All right. So.
Uh, we can also... Mine doesn't seem to be working. I'm just copying and pasting. I can see what the problem was before, because I was using shift and that special character instead of the backwards apostrophe. Oh. Um, but I've copied your bits of code in. Um, not Have you got this first bit? I'm just trying to work out where did I start? Started there. So have you got this YAML bit still? Let me just copy that YAML. Oh, I haven't got the format HTML and all that bit. I'll just change that. But anyway, so the YAML lets you do some other funky bits and pieces to things. So just by changing that YAML and now rendering it. Uh, Let's Not see. Where... <laughs> Where's that gone? Oh, it's gone here. So now uh, it's added, a f it's just done a few tweaks to it. So we've added a nice little color block for our top. What my One of my favorite bits now is it's now sort of numbered all my sections. And also we have uh, an interactive table of contents, uh, which it's built itself based on our little hashtags. So if I want to go from one bit of the report to the next, uh, it it will through there. Uh, it will just go through there. And as I sort of scroll up and down, this will just dynamically update as as I go, uh, which is really really nice. Just by those little tweaks I've just pasted into the 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 um into the chat. So the T T O C is table of contents, and like I say it's added that in there. It's added the numbers, so it's added the 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 numbers to the sections added a total block banner and the, the code of the color code of the uh, of the report. So that's looking relatively snazzy. I hope everybody has got that. I will I will definitely send you the full complete code if uh, that doesn't work. Um, I was going to do, here's one I prepared earlier. So let me just show you here and I will send you the link to this uh, at a, a, a later stage. So here's, so within NHS England, we, we did do some sort of tutorial stuff, but again, this is open to everybody. So I, I will share the, the code for you. So this whole bit here is a quarter report and there are various bits of pieces around uh, some of the stuff that it's done. So I've got about 20 minutes or so. I think we're aiming to finish at half past four. However, I'm happy to stay on for a couple of minutes here and there if needs be. So I'm going to try to whiz through this in sort of 10 minutes, do some 10 minutes for some sort of future links and then see where we can go through uh, that. So, yeah, I'm happy to I'll ping you the code in a minute. Um, so this is just a bit of a combination of what we've just done, but some more of the advanced stuff that we can do on Quarto. So obviously we can sort of run code. Uh, we can sort of it tries to explain what the YAML does. Uh, talks about what the hashes does and like I said what you can do is literally go side by side and here is all the code that creates the, the report that I'm showing you so all of this the code for this is is here and it all runs off publicly available data sets so you can download that code and you can run it locally um, so this just shows you the differences between uh, the hashes so if you put different levels of hashing it will make different subsets of uh, of, of data, uh, sorry, of headings. And likewise, when you've got your table of contents, if you click on it, you can see that there's like subheadings within the headings where you've got, got that. So it does all of that automatically for you. Um, you can do things like uh, change your uh, code to italics and bold and sort of subscript, etc. That's all easy and you can do sort of like strike throughs so if you want to make a bit of text bold you can you can do that uh, and you can also sort of add uh, box quotes and that's so that's all available uh, you can do things like create lists automatically so if you've got like a list and you've got sort of a, a numeric list it will do that and it will automatically sort of create those and uh, and, and do those if you want to and you're good at html you can add html uh, tags into your uh, into your markdown and you can use html so if you wanted to you can uh, change your <laughs> change your tags to comic sans and it obviously will come out in comic sans but yeah please don't do that uh, but yeah if you wanted to use um, uh, uh, html stuff to do stuff uh, you can do things like add like sections spans spans of different colors etc which is really really nice 
one of the things that Corto does really nicely is these little uh, call out blocks. So if you've got like a, a, a note or a tip or a, a warning, literally you can just like create, this is a code which creates these little, uh, uh, yeah, little uh, little call outs, et cetera. And you can make them so that they sort of collapse and open out, et cetera. So it's all sort of then become sort of a little bit more interactive. Uh, you can do things like you can insert pictures and images, and you can also add in uh, animated GIFs. Um, it's not linked up for this one, but hopefully you can still see that, you know, there is there is a GIF. Um, you can also change the, the width of your report if you so wish. Um, and as you can see, as I scroll up this, I've changed the width of this and it's going to go over my table of contents. But as I go up, my table of contents automatically uh, hides. But it's still there. It's just hidden because I've made my report wider. So again, really, really nice that you can uh, do things like that. Um, then we're going to load in some data and we're going to do some stuff. We've done some basic plots before, so we've seen all that and that's good. We've done some tables. It's really nice if you want to do sort of um, sort of how you format your report. So if you want um, a, a plot and have some text on the side, uh, it's really quite nice and easy to sort of create columns and say, I want my plot on the side and I want my, my, my text on this side. Um, if you want to do sort of like SPC charts, et cetera, can't go into it now massively. But as you can see, this is the code required uh, to uh, to create a, an SPC plot, which is like absolutely nothing. We made it as simple as possible. Uh, and you can create these uh, quite funky SPC plots and you can have those. Again, sort of side by side with some text for each one of these, et cetera. So that's all really, really nice. Um, you can do things like having sort of inline code, which we, we've sort of sort of had a quick go at where we talked about our, our minimum max. Um, and there's also some really nice functions, which there's, a, there's an English function which takes a number and converts it into text. Uh, which is which is also quite nice, um, and uh, it's, it's it's very good at doing that. So if you want to change your English, uh, you know your number into English, it's uh, it, it's quite nice. Uh, another thing that's just really nice is that you can create sort of tab sets of data. So we've got here we've got a uh, provider RX four. We can see our our type ones and twos. But if I want to then plot that over into RF four, I can click on a different tab, and then you know I've got. A little bit more interaction between uh, me and my data, which is really, really nice. And you could have, you know, a plot on one side and then a table underneath it, etc. So you can you can maximize the amount of data that you're giving people and whatever, but actually minimize the amount of you know ink that you use, as it were. And I don't know, there's something really nice, and I'll show you. Some, if I've got time, I'll show you some examples of what I've done. Actual practical reports where I've created commentary that go alongside a table and table and charts all the commentary that talk about the the data is all sort of dynamic but it all runs across like um uh you know if it's talking about increases it's looking at the spc chart and reads that this is statistically increasing or if we've got an outlier it, it runs sort of standard deviation tests etc so rather than just saying performance has changed and it has gone up by two from last month it actually talks about the trends and you know outliers rather than just that really tedious it's gone up by 0 0.1 which is you know completely completely useless for everybody um we touched on gt tables other 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 plotting uh and other table um things are available so cables quite a nice one if you just want like quite static plots uh, and you can do sort of here's some examples here that you can do that you know you can do all that sort of conditional formatting etc gt is my current favorite i think at the moment um and that allows you to do sort of like attendances and uh sorry attendances like, like mini bar plots and things like that and i use those quite exclusively it also allows you and i think i showed very briefly when i talking about projects you can put a gt plot into a table so that's where i was building my little spc spark line so i was very keen of getting spc into a data summary but still having a spark line that's going to be meaningful because unfortunately excel and i think tableau as well when it gives spark lines it just shows the line without any numbers on it so it's just the wibbly line which is completely and utterly meaningless 
Tufty, who created the Spotline, said, you know, you should have your min and your max on there so you can actually see the scale, uh, which is what I tried to do. So um, that's that's that. You can also create um, sort of interactive tables. So again, from this amount of code, uh, this produces this table where I can click through and I've got nice, nice little sliders I can, I can choose. So if I choose my, uh, where are we? Let's just choose RK. Nine, uh, I can filter my data down or I can remove my filters. If I wanted to, I could copy that and that would copy the data into my onto the clipboard or I could click CSV and it would also then save a CSV of the data that I filtered. Uh, I could also change it so I can see 25 values rather than 10, et cetera, and I can sort of plug through and see those. Uh, I can also reorder them. So if I want to order it by type, I can do that. So again, you can make these really nice reports that I can send you. I can attach this to an email and send it to you, and you would have all this interactivity. You wouldn't have to have R installed or anything. You know, literally, you could have all this interactivity in a report, which I can send to you, and you can, you know, it could just be attached on a on, on a document. Uh, there's React table, which is really good if you've got like hierarchical data and you want to say, well, this is my like top level, and then I want to drill down and see what my uh, attendance is look like at a, a smaller level. And then if I want to drill down into individual areas. So if you want to do the um, sort of groupings, as it were, um, this is really good because it just takes the raw data and it creates all the aggregates for you. And then you just have these nice little drop, you know, expansions if you want to do uh, certain things. So, uh, again, a little bit more code, but I mean, like I said, the code's there and you can have a flip through and, and do that. And there are other tables. Um, we can also use Plotly. I talked about Plotly early. So ggplot is your absolute classic. But what you can do is take a ggplot that you've created and feed it into ggplotly. And then that turns the plot that I created earlier into an interactive plot. So now the plot that I just had, uh, I've got like hover over details. If I want to, I can click and I can drag into a specific area and it will uh, allow me to sort of look at a specific point. Um, if I want to, I can turn off and um, on individual traces um, and whoop, let's turn them all back on again. And if I wanted to, I can do compare on hover so I could see oh, what was the point for each of those at the same sort of period. And literally, that is just taking the plot that I created earlier and just adding GG plotly around it. And it then turns it into this beautiful uh, sort of interactive plot. And uh, you know, likewise, I could drill down into this specific area if that's what I wanted and then I could take a picture as it and it would save it as a, a PNG as a as an image which then I can take away and use elsewhere so Plotly is is fabulous uh, you can also sort of plot directly into Plotly uh, so this is a, an interesting example and a really good example for the zoom so if I zoomed into this area you can see it's made up of lots of little box plots and what's really interesting is when I hover over my box plots, it gives me the details of my quartiles and they sort of come up as a, as, as a hover over, which is really, really nice. Uh, and again, literally that is the code to bring through and, and build this plot. Um, and what you can do, and there's a lot more code here than is, is necessary, is if you wanted to, you can make nice animated graphs. Uh, <laughs> Uh, not the best use case ever, but we've got this lovely sort of automation where we can sort of oh. flick and we can we, we can see that. I have used it as a proper thing. It's really good if you like have a population pyramid and you want to show changes in population over time. So that was really good. I did one for for COVID for our, our mental health trust to show the the difference in our populations for who was getting referred to us. And that was really, really quite interesting. So if you've got sort of more data along that sort of line, it's, you know, there is there are some really good use cases where actually sort of that animation is, is really good. However, what's not such a good use, uh, good use of, of plots is the is the 3D plot. Um, a bit like the old 3D play chart, but this is a 3D scatter chart. Uh, but however, it is sort of fully interactive and I can uh, zoom in and out and then pretend I'm in space and try to make sense of that. Uh, how useful that is <laughs> remains to be seen. 
but it's just to show that potentially, you know, you you can do these things. Please don't put 3D scatter plots into your re reports. Um, but yeah, you can <laughs> if you really, really want to. Uh, another really, really nice package, uh, which is uh, for, for time series, is digraphs, which is what this is. So this is looking at admissions over time. And we've just got our, our, our normal sort of hover over areas. And we can do things like we can sort of zoom in to sort of specific windows and we can sort of change those, et cetera. Uh, what it also allows us to do is, uh, haven't labeled it, which I really, really should do, is to create a sort of a smoothing uh, element to it. So if I want to smooth this to a window of seven, um, it then instantly applies that to the graph. Uh, and that's really quite cool that you can just apply a different level of smoothing onto your raw data just on the fly and, and play with it. But, so again, that's really, really nice. Um, really nice uh, bit I did for just this. Again, this is just for straight GG plots, but uh, creating a, a Likert scale for, for um, survey results. So really, really nice to, to sort of see what's what's going on there. Uh, and there's, you know, really, really nice sort of uh, way of sort of standardizing and presenting survey results using sort of like it scales so that's that's really nice and again a little bit more uh more code and this is again about setting factors for things about which order things go in but you can have a look on that um obviously we're not a fan of of, of pie charts tree charts are a, a, a sort of a, a, a an alternative but we can make sort of interactive charts so is that so we've got our sort of pie chart here which has got our rh1 and our rh4 and our different ones but they are all too interactive so we can sort of click click on them and sort of uh, see the differences across each of those still not a massive fan of these and you sort of you can click on them and you can have sort of multiple hierarchies of how they work but i quite like the transitions they look quite funky but i'm um, still not massively a, a fan uh we can do interactive dendrograms which is a sort of a, a, a really good if you've got something where you want to show flow oh, from... my head hurts. sorry oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> brain hurts sorry uh really really nice if we want to show sort of flow through a system and we can sort of make these beautiful uh sort of opening out sort of trees which we can sort of play with uh, and see what those look like and uh, do various different things like that. So that's that's really quite nice. I think that one no, it doesn't go out any deeper. I think I stopped it there. So if you want to show that sort of flow through the system and show the relative size of, of something, another one is a, a Sankey. And um, I don't think I've got the example here, but you can make you know really quite nice interactive sort of Sankey diagrams and, uh, uh, and, and things like that. Where are we? We are here. Uh, Again, this is an absolutely bonkers one, but potentially you can go down this route. So this is using a nationally available, uh, I don't know, it's, it's American uh, measles data, looking at the 1960s when they introduced the measles vaccination and the numbers of numbers of cases. And then each of these is a city. So this is a plotly graph. So this is one of our classic ones where we want to sort of zoom in and actually sort of see, hopefully you can start to see that there are sort of specific uh, countries here, sorry, countries, counties, uh, American counties here, and the numbers of cases. This is where we they introduced the, the vaccine and we can see obviously massively dropped off and we can see sort of the, the numbers over on the, the side here. Way, way, way too busy and need to be about 10 times bigger to, to make sense of it. Um, but again, really quite interesting in just that we've got a plot, we've got a, and we've got like multiple side plots on our on our data set as well as a sort of plot. So that's that's just just crazy. Um, we can also do um, interactive plots with you know different options within our data set. So rather than having um, all our data in one go, we can have options so that we can sort of pick different data sets and, and plot them across the same sort of. Thing. So this is just picking different uh, different sites, and then we can see what those look like. Um, we can do we can do maps. So if you want to do sort of like chloropleth maps or heat maps around things, you can sort of create maps of things. Again, these are sort of like interactive, so I can sort of zoom around and 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 move around. Uh, we can also sort of turn on and off 
different layers, as it were. Um, this little man is spinning mainly because up here, where is it? I can't remember now. Yes, there was an option for spin, and I just had to work out what spin equals true means. And uh, strangely, what it means is the little icon spins around and around. There you go. Uh, not that sure what use that is. But again, I think having those icons and I've done sort of like LSAO heat maps and all of those kind of things, you can you can do those and there's lots of tutorials around those. Uh, blah, 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 blah. We can make uh, sort of like word clouds and we can do sort of like texture analysis and sort of natural language processing. Um, obviously, I've taken an excerpt from a uh, commonly common copyright free book here which hopefully you can work out the book from, from the word cloud. Again, this is all interactive, so you can look over and you can see uh, how many uh, times each of these things appeared. So uh, where are we? Limbs apparently appears once in the text that I present. Obviously, said turned up massively. Caterpillar 21. Alice appeared 20 times. Um, so hopefully you can work out what that did. Um, I did mention earlier that you can also create sort of flow diagrams and um, sort of use Mermaid. So this is like Mermaid code here to create a flow chart. And then this is the result it spits out. So I've done it so that I'm showing the code. Obviously, you can do it so you don't show the code. So you can make these really nice sort of like flow diagrams of, of how things work. Or you can get into like really sort of like quite complex diagrams, which is you know, just from this code here, uh, and you can sort of like create quite quite complex um, um, diagrams of how things are going and sort of interactions be things between things. And again, that's all using Mermaid. There's a really nice website for Mermaid, which allows you to sort of click and drag and then spit out the code. And then that will sort of come through here. Um, and again, there's another one called Graphviz. And I think that's as far as I'm going to go now, because I think we've got three minutes. I will share the link to where this is. And, you know, all the code is available up on the GitHub. And that is available. So where are we at? We are at very, very nearly finishy time. Let's go back to here. What have we got? Where is it? Where to find help? Online learning resources and finding help and functions. So I didn't go into the help, which was very, very naughty. What does this function do? Um, which I really, really should have done, and I'm very, very naughty. Um, there is a help feature, massively, really, really useful in, in R. Can't recommend it enough. So basically, you can uh, hover your cursor over something and press F1, or you can search, and it will come up with a description of what the function does, what kind of data it needs in, and what are the arguments which go into that function, and usually comes out with also a reproducible example of uh, how to how to use it. So R's got some built-in data sets just in the background, just so it can run a function over some basic data so that you can see this is how this function works, and uh, that's really good. You can also just in the console put a question mark and the name of the function, and it will it will tell you what the what the function does. Um, getting help, obviously, I'll send out details to the Slack NHSR Slack group. Can't can't say how great that is uh, nearly enough. Um, I also run a coffee and code session, which is once every two weeks, which is basically an hour drop in session where people either come and do show and tells around stuff, what they've been up to. Um, I think the next one I'm doing next week, I'm just going to do some live coding uh, around some stuff and just show you how I, uh, how I tackle uh, a project. Um, and also we've got an NHS Futures page, which has got recordings of a fair number of previous things on there. So uh, like I said, one of them was around how to write, how I, how I did sort of automated commentary. And there's sort of lots of, you know, it's really, really nice to see what other people have done and their sort of outputs just to inspire yourself is, oh, great, I'm I'm not going to get there now, but I can see that. And likewise, if they can share their code and I can run it, um, you know, you can slowly unpick it. And also, it's just a really safe place to pop a question in the chat or ask people, how do I do this? And, you know, nobody is going to just go, ha, 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 and harass you how to do that. We've all been there. We all realize what a steep learning curve it is. And we are all 
absolutely you know fills us with joy when we go yeah i know the answer to that because it makes me feel great so um you know do uh, do come in do feel welcome do feel free to ask really newbie questions it's not a problem uh popular packages have cheat sheets um which are available as, as pdf downloads i think even within our studio itself uh if i remember correctly you can is it uh, oh it's gone to sleep of course it has um i think there isn't what's it in it's good to see that. I'll come back to that in a minute. I think there is an option to view some of the cheat sheets, but again, you can download them and it gives you, again, you know, does what it says on the tin. It is some cheat sheets. Definitely save your script. You should do that as you go along. Our Studio Cloud is very good that it does it as it goes. But obviously, if you're working on UDAL or in um, on your desktop, make sure that you do save your script. There's some recommended reading there. I'm not going to go through it now. Um, all the slides will be available. Uh, not going to go through all that. Not going to go through all that. I'm not going to go through that. So quickly skipping on to the ongoing learning. As I said right at the start, every day is a school day. I mean, absolutely get out there and use it. Find other people's code. Unpick it. Um, just, you know, you've got to lose it, use it or lose it. Because if you don't go away from this course and start using it, the half-life, it will just dribble out of your ears uh, before you know it. So absolutely get out there and, and, and do it. Um, Stack Overflow is is your friend. Uh, it's everybody's friend. So Google stuff and look for Stack Overflow. And I guarantee somebody's going to come up with a similar sort of question that, than you have. Um, so really, really, it's worth understanding the vocabulary needed to describe the problem. So as, as it says there's some of that you will not have the right answer question you won't be able to formulate the question properly but you know keep trying you'll, you'll, you'll get there as i said there's more than one way to write uh some people don't use tidy verse they use pure pure r because it's so much so much more pure or, and there's other ways of doing things as well so don't feel that you know you get you know one answer and it's the right one um and you know just do what works is is fine don't don't let I need my code to be perfect to get in the way of I need my code to work. And yeah, the other one is just be aware of the date of the answer. If something's really, really old, then it, there's a possibility that it's gone out of date. I'm not going to go through the example. Uh, there's some books there, which I can recommend. Those are all free um, and, and available. And there's some details there. There's a sort of NHS R community blog. If anybody just wants to write a really quick blog and just say what your experience of the R training is or where you are in your R journey and you know where you think you're going to go next, they would bite your hand off and who knows, you might even get a free mug uh, to, to write a blog. There are other links there um, around what people have done. R bloggers is, is really good, um, uh, which is a, a fabulous place and has a real mix of, of, of what people have done. Um, obviously, I said the NHSR Slack channel can't uh, can't push that enough. Uh, well, we don't use Twitter anymore. Um, <laughs> uh, government data science uh, Slack is also really, really good. Uh, so I would recommend that as well. Uh, I think this is just some other talks. Um, and just to say, most of the courses and training that the NHSR community do are also available on uh, on the YouTube, and that will also link to the materials. So if you want to have a look at the materials, and uh, you can do that. I will send a follow up email to everybody just with some pointers. Make sure I've given you the Slack, show you where that NHSR stuff is, give you my GitHub handle so you can go and have a look at any of the stuff I've got. I am three minutes over, which is really naughty of me. I will throw it open. If anybody does want to hang on, if you have got another 10 minutes, I'm happy just to show some like real life reports that I've worked on. But I appreciate if you know you do need to go, then you need to go. Claire. Thanks, Simon. Um, Sarah McKay in the chat has asked whether you can connect R to an SQL database. I'm wondering, because we do that all the time, do you have any nice yes. redacted codes where you do that that you could chuck in to show how to get started? Uh yes. So it depends. Are you a are you a um NHSE person or a outside person? Uh NHS Grampian. Okay, so might be slightly different. Obviously, we've got a UDAL warehouse, so it's not uh, you know, all our connection strings to our um 
uh, uh, SDO are going to be slightly different, but the principle will be the same. You will need, um, I assume you will have a username, you will have a name of your database server, and then there is just setting up a connection string. There is something within our futures page, and I'm happy to share that. Um, but yeah, you should have, what is it called? I can't remember. What's the connection string to SQL called? Uh, the thingy. I can't remember now. I've lost the word for it. Uh, anyway, so yeah, you should have a connection to it. And there is a package, ODBC, that's what I'm looking for, so that you should have an like ODBC address, etc. cetera. And um, you, can, you can use that to connect up to SQL. So yeah, absolutely, you can connect up to SQL. What, there is also a package called dbplyr, which basically allows you to use dplyr verbs directly into the SQL database. So you don't even have to write SQL. You can write dbplyr uh, stuff, um, which allows you to sort of um, interrogate the database, do all your joins, etc., but using dplyr type verbs. It then converts it all over into SQL, which is quite magic. Yeah, if your SQL server is young enough. Yes. Yeah, I don't think it doesn't hold on, does it? So cool. I was in the chat. Anybody else got any questions? <laughs> ODBC, that's it. <laughs> Otherwise, I mean, I'm happy to show you just very quickly, like here's one I prepared earlier, a real life report. I just need to find something that hasn't got, uh, I think I've got some publicly available stuff. Um, so I'm not sharing anything that shouldn't otherwise be shared. Uh, where are we? Uh, what is, 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 Yeah, waiting list that will do. Uh, okay, so it's come a bit weird. Anyway, um, so this uh, just report on community waiting lists. So this is publicly available late data. It does get published, so I'm not sharing anything I shouldn't be sharing. Um, we're looking at it as a as a Southwest region and we're doing basic comparisons across the ICBs to, to look at what's going on across each of our ICBs. Uh, we split out children and adults and basically this whole report is automated. It pulls through and it creates all the narrative all by its little self. So uh, things like the Southwest has a total of X number of patients equates to such and such per population against the national uh, total of that. And that's the national population uh, rate per, per population, which puts the Southwest in the middle of the country of the seven regions. So we're bang, in, bang average, as it were. Uh, but again, all that text is dynamic. And if that will change, it will change that position for, for, for where we are. Um, so the free ICBs with the highest rates are such and such and such and such and such and such. Just try to find uh, something a little bit more interesting. I don't think yeah, I've actually got much more interesting. So longest wait by service is Moscow Skeletal, which makes up 30, 40% of the waiting list. Second most prevalent of that. So all of this stuff is just pulled out from the data and is just dynamically updated as, as it comes through. Um, so that's quite interesting. So children's second lowest in the county of the seven regions. Um, we've then got a, a relatively simple table to show these are the NHS regions and then these are the ICBs within our region. We can then see it as our rate per population, a little graph to see who's higher. So we can see that Bristol actually is really quite high, whereas Dorset is, is really quite low, uh, which is quite interesting. We can also see what percentage of our, our, um, our patients are waiting over 52 weeks. So that we see actually the Southwest has got quite a, a long waiter problem. And then definitely within my ICB, I can see that my Bristol and my Devon are on the on the naughty step there. 
with Bristol very much on the noise step as having really lots of over 104 week waiters. So this is talking about community waiting list, not elective waiting list. Um, and um, yeah, so a bit of an oversight on there. I've got things like rate trend, which is based on uh, my sort of IC, sorry, on my SPCs. So this is where I've got like my Bristol North East and I've got a, a, an increase that equates to my little Bristol North crease, my little increase here. So my up and down arrow is based on my SPC. It's not just doing a two point comparison and saying, oh, it's gone up from last month or whatever. It's actually got a bit of statistical analysis on there. Oh, look at me. I have actually, look at me with my dual axis chart. So I've done my Pareto chart uh, to show this is the number of patients and this is how many, uh, how what proportion of the waiting list they make up. So you can see quite clearly if we go up to about 80% that these first four uh, treatment functions make up about 80% of the waiting list. I've also got error bar. So this is showing the, the Southwest and then this is showing where they are compared to the rest of the country. So the dot is the national average. And as we said, we were pretty much in the middle compared to the, the national. Um, and then that's the, the range. But we can see for therapy interventions, actually, we're really quite high in the Southwest compared to everybody else. So being able to combine several different types of charts really tells quite a good story. Um, and I think you know, people first see this and go, ah, what's going on there? But actually, if you can sit and you can explain what the chart is, and I think it does explain it in text below, uh, you know, you can come up with some quite nice stuff. Um, also, as I said, I've got SPCs here. So here I've done my classic facet wrap, which we sort of showed earlier. Um, but I can also have got a bunch of tabs so that we can see the the difference across each of the different areas as well, which also shows that we've got some serious data quality issues because Somerset only appeared to have for four months had some patients with musculoskeletal problems and then those patients completely disappeared off the face of the earth, uh, which is which is interesting. So definitely looking at that. So, and then I've got things like chart interpretation to tell you what the, the colours of the SPCs means, and then a nice little cab a big bunch of caveats around what the data is and where it's from and how it's all calculated. So that's a very, very quick and simple, dirty report um, that I've put together. Um, and again, if you look on my GitHub, there are sort of various bits and pieces there. All the code for that is, is shared, and you can go and have a look and see how I've built that. So just a, a quick use example. Um, unless there's any other massive questions, which I can't see anything in the chat. Has anybody got any last minute questions? No? Thank you all very much. You all deserve a, a participation medal for listening to me blurble on for a, a full day. Um, yes, so... Thank you all very much. And um, hopefully I will, well, I will send out some details for the Coffee and Code. Might see some of you next week for the intermediate course. And uh, yeah, do feel free to ping me any questions and uh, make sure obviously this is all available for you. Cool. Thank you very much. Catch you later. Thanks. Thank you, Simon. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.